All right, so today is May 30th, 2021, and we're going to continue our discussion on the Desiderata Extinction Nadi. So um, we can open it up to any questions. Um, thank you, last, in the last meeting, you ended with the, um, that was Daniel Everett and the Piraha, and uh, you were saying that the uh, Piraha don't commit suicide. And that kind of changed Daniel Everett's mind about Christianity and more into the Piraha's his way of thinking. Um, just wanted to say, I think the reason why I took a note here, Piraha don't commit suicide. Um, I think you talked about it before. Um, well, I think they don't have a concept of suicide and um, with the Piraha, their ego boundary is not just the individual self, it's with the, uh, the, the tribe, right? So if, I mean, if they commit suicide on themselves, it's like they're killing off the whole tribe. I mean, that's how I interpret it. Um, um, yeah, or, no, that's yeah, not quite my understanding. The, the thing to remember is that they will happily kill somebody else. Oh, okay. So... Yeah, they're not averse to like killing somebody for for do or getting you know even revenge. I think, but they have a kind of a childlike um, kind of a freedom, really. And they, in, in that, they can't conceive just just like a kid can't conceive, you know, because they're happy. They they often called the happiest people on earth, and so you can't imagine a, a young kid really committing suicide and that's in a very bleak situation like our culture puts them in but in a normal village atmosphere or indigenous atmosphere you can't you can't conceive of them doing violence against themselves so it's it's they thought it was funny because it's kind of like an on goal it's it's it never occurred to them that you could do violence to yourself because obviously you do violence to somebody else and so the, the whole concept made them laugh um, in, a, in a way you know it's uh, what, what it's kind of a boomerang effect it's kind of, it's kind of like you know so I can't think just off the top of my head something where where we, is equivalent for us that you couldn't couldn't ever imagine doing to yourself that it's something you do to somebody else so you know that the concept of killing somebody was there it's what really blew their minds was that you would do it to yourself. It's like they just didn't compute. They never thought that was kind of possible. It's kind of like stepping on a rake and getting bashed in the eye. <laughs> it was really funny. Um, and it's they, almost it, like they're, they're happy. Like you said, they're happy with themselves. So if there's a problem, it's not themselves. That's the cause of the problem. It could be the external, you know, another person. And so it's okay to hurt or kill the other person. But not kill themselves because they're okay uh, yeah I, w I would say this, that that they live a very immediate life so they live immediately in the present moment and so if they killed somebody they wouldn't it, do premeditated murder you know basically they it would kind of be like there and then there we go, like, oh but, i see yeah but, so they um yeah, it, I think the best way to describe it is they're not dominated by the alien cortex. And I think that's the real lesson in all of that, is that the reason why Everett's stepmother commits suicide is because it's all alien cortex. The alien cortex is thinking and ruminating about its life. And, and you know, I bet you before she committed suicide, she, she wasn't in any pain or anything like that. It was all emotional pain. And, you know, people who commit suicide in our society 
they feel the weight of the world on them. They feel that the tax man's after them. They got debts. Their wife's left them. You know, it's all like singing the blues, like the cowboy, you know, took my Chevy and the dog kind of thing. And all of that is in the alien cortex. And you see, the Purana don't have the concept of, you know, the Chevy and the dog and the tax man and stuff. If, you know, if they're not immediately in pain or something, it's like, you know, what the hell? They don't ruminate about this. So one of the reasons why Everett couldn't convince them about Christianity is they asked him to stop talking about it. And the reason was because, you know, he kept on going on about Jesus. And eventually they asked him, like, who is this Jesus guy? And he said, oh, well, he lived thousands of years ago. And they said, well, wait a minute. You haven't met the guy? He says, well, in my heart and stuff. And they said, no, yeah, I mean, you, you can't walk up to the guy and say hello. You've never met him in real. And he said, no. Then they said, well, shut the fuck up. We don't want to hear about this bullshit. This is not a guy you know. It's just, what, what are you talking about? It's it's best. It's secondhand hearsay from never. It's like they said, don't talk to us about that. Talk to us about a guy you know. It's, you know. You see, what they're saying is you're lying. You're not talking from the heart. You're making up stories about this guy you never know. It's a, kind of an insult to them. They say, like, we want to know about, you know, Fred and John, guys you've met. <laughs> not, not some Jesus character which is vague and you only heard from here saying. So, they, 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 so the way to interpret it, again, is entirely alien cortex-free. It's no overlay and it's no, <clears throat> no lying. It's very direct and it's very honest. So they they call us apagaiche, which means or language apagaiche, which means like crooked head, and they call themselves you know their own language in relation to ours, straight head, and you can see because the alien cortex is always lying, it's always substituting, it's always inverting, it's always scheming, and so you know they they don't accept that because it would be a liability for them in their in their lifestyle it doesn't serve you in, if you live in the in the amazon if you make long term plans and stuff like for example catching fish for a week instead of just for for, for today uh, you know that that wouldn't work in the amazon they don't have well they have fridges now <laughs> but, but they didn't have fridges and stuff like that so you know what do you do with all the fish that you catch it's you know it's, it's going to attract insects and be a disease vector if you can't try and store it. So they, they're living in a kind of an Eden. And they, but here's the thing. It's not that they unspoilt and then they're just lucky because they're innocent. They worked hard, like ever it found, to get rid of the alien cortex. They knew damn well about the alien cortex. They knew damn well what traders and slavers and things would come and get they had lots of experience and they knew it was evil so then so and that's that's a common theme is that a lot of the things were they're, they're no lost tribes that we don't know about and you know like they have like in the bbc or something you know lost tribe <laughs> that's all shit. there's nothing like that there hasn't been for 100 years anything close to a lost tribe but those guys that seem innocent and can't count and stuff is when they tried to teach them how to count above three, they found that there was active resistance. It wasn't that they, they were stupid or they were innocent. They actively resisted that. And they say like, and then you know the missionaries and all these other guys, they were amazed. They're like, how are you guys going to get anywhere if you if you won't listen to our lessons? You know, Portuguese missionaries and stuff. And then the you know they didn't ever understand that. If they did start behaving that way, their culture and their existence would fall apart. But the Pirahan knew that very well, and the missionaries, and I mean, even up to Everett, didn't get it. it took Everett decades. <laughs> to, no, it took Everett more than a decade, at least, to get the picture that they were actively resisting, and that was a good thing. But when, once you get onto that, you start, you know then your world falls apart because then you realize, hang on a minute, it's civilization and all the stuff that we've done that hasn't served us very well. <laughs> We'd be much better off. Those guys are healthier, happier. They're living a much better life than we are. And so it's like, well, but but we've been to the moon. <laughs> it's like, yeah, what the hell good has it done us? We're going to wipe ourselves out. So 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it, it seems like it's a pattern. So you talked about the Piraha. And then a um, just recently, I listened to this podcast, Fall of Civilizations. And it's very, very good stuff about how civilizations fell. And one, one I found intriguing was the um, Rapa, the Rapa Nui people of Easter Island. So I think there's a contention. People, I think the common belief is that uh, the island fell into ecological disaster, and then people did cannibalism and, and they wiped themselves out. But it actually, in that uh, podcast, it talked about how um, there wasn't much violence at the time um, uh, until it wasn't until the Dutch came, Spanish, es es essentially Europeans came and kind of uh, turned the world upside down, um, first through um, the smallpox and the disease vectors. Um, just the fact that, yeah, I guess the point was that if Europeans come to your place, they'll ruin you. <laughs> it was just sad to hear. Yeah, well, you see, Easter Island is very contentious because a lot rides on it. You see, if um, Jared Diamond started all of this thing about Rapa Nui and Easter Island, because the first interpretation of it was the, the early, Europeans saw it intact and then later ones came and they were, you know, it was really devastated. They were, it was deforested. The population had de declined to almost nothing. I think it's, it's hard to tell. What's at stake is, is this kind of Hobbesian view, is the heart of man really evil? So in other words, is it, will humans destroy themselves if you put them on an island? It's basically William Golding's Lord of the Flies. So is it, it, are humans destined to, you know, like a plague, just take over an island and destroy it? And then other guys say, no, no, then you get all this new left-wing thing, which is, you know, um, white men are evil, and, you know, as soon as you touch a white man, you're going to die. Um, I think, well, first of all, you've got to take a step back from it because the guys are Polynesians, right? And if you look at the Polynesians, those guys are not saints. <laughs> so, so one of the things that I think populated Easter Island is that the Polynesians were moving east across the Pacific. Now, one of the reasons why they moved from island to island, they migrated, was because of this dam thing which I can never remember what it's called again but it's basically it's a poison on the reef so it's it's a natural poison um, if you eat too much reef fish in, in in an area where where it bioaccumulates in fish but it's it's actually a, a kind of a seaweed or uh, no algal bloom I think yeah it's it's called damn it's always on the tip of my tongue I can remember. Um, oh, it's just on the tip of my tongue. But anyway, that disease, which you still get now, you, you sailors have to watch out, especially in the Pacific. Um, so what, what would happen is the islands would get overrun by this damn thing that's on the tip of my tongue, and then they would have to move eastward. So they eventually got to, um, got to Easter Islands. Now, there are a couple of things to note. One of them is they had writing, <laughs> so they full on alien cortex. Um, they were competitive, right? They would have these races to get to this island to, you know, get eggs at a, at a certain season. Whoever won that, you know, would, their tribe and stuff would be get ascendancy for a year and privileges for a year. So they, they were kind of competitive. And the other thing is when you look at all the statues, the guys are they they matri patrilineal, right? They have they have families and the families have statuses and the Moai have headdresses, which you can see the rules that you know each one of the Moai is probably you know advertising as this is my ancestor and the guys are in competition with the other whose whose ancestor is bigger than the other one. So you can see them in this kind of arms race. So yeah. I think that it's it can't be the modern story where oh no it was all the one 
There's another thing is that when the when the the settlers who found it kind of deserted, they they did eventually find some some of the inhabitants drastically reduced, but they were hiding in caves, and they were cowering in the caves. So when the guys you know came and coaxed them out, the the guys were terrified because you know basically they had serious wars and calendars and stuff. So so it's yeah, I don't know. It, I don't know if you can draw any serious lessons from East Iron because the picture's too murky. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, um, yeah, if you look at the Maoris in, in Hawaii or uh, the, look, look at, uh, you know, Polynesians, um, the Polynesians that went to New Zealand, the Maoris, they were bastards, <laughs> real, real bastards. So there's a story. Um, where there were two branches. Uh, the Maoris, they kind of split. One group went to New Zealand, the other went to the Chatham Islands. Nobody knew about the ones in the Chatham Islands till about 1740, when a ship dropped by, and it found all these guys living on the Chatham Islands, and they were the exact opposite to the Maoris, although they were, they were also cousins. They were living sustainably, and very, very peacefully, they were matriarchy. They actually managed their population by castrating, you know, all but a few of the boys. Um, and so, you know, but but they didn't have any war. They didn't have any concept of war. So this, this, uh, the ship that found them then pulls into Christchurch and says, you know, there's these guys, thousands of them all living peacefully on the Chatham Islands, just to east of here. When the Maoris heard that, they said, but hang on a minute, run that by me again. These guys have no weapons and they don't understand war. And they said, yeah, absolutely. And they said, holy shit, got in the longboats, headed there straight and slaughtered them. <laughs> I guess they said, like, they, they couldn't believe that there were a bunch of suckers that didn't, didn't go in for war. They, like, thought, wow, we can take all their stuff, take their women. So the, the Maoris are not cool guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and by the time you get to Haiti and stuff, those those guys are all cannibals down there, man. They're, those guys in puppets and stuff, they <laughs> they they still just on the edge of cannibalism. <laughs> so it's it's like you got to be careful. The, I think the 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 split is is alien cortex. And so if you if you see the alien cortex somewhere, you know they're kind of doomed. Either it comes from the Europeans or it comes from the 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 native ancestors, but all those guys, the Maoris and stuff, they have Neanderthal genes in them. So so they have not not a great percentage, but yeah, you know, I keep on saying that the big bastards are the Aryans, and it seems to be because it's a maladapted hybrid of of the worst traits of Cro Magnums and Neanderthals. But they, the the Polynesians also have Denisovan, Neanderthal, and Cro Magnum. So they, they also have the alien cortex uh, with this, you know, hybridized virulent <laughs> form. See, everybody in Africa also has an alien cortex, but it, it's not this kind of a weird, weird one, where which is massively acquisitive, massively controlling, massively scared of death. Basically, Aryans. <laughs> yeah. oh. so, so, so when when those guys, when the modern left wing uh, you know, woke crowd says, oh, you know, it was because of colonialism. I think it's not helpful. I think they should say it's because of alien courtesism. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a good point. Because, um, yeah, I was I was starting to get skeptical because, um, yeah, like you said, they had, did have the Rapa Nui, did have a writing system. They they said that they had competitions and it was called the like Birdman competitions, and they said, that's, "Well, that's right, Birdman." Yeah, before yeah, the, the eggs, yeah. Right, yeah. they claimed before the Europeans came that they did. They only had these competitions, and they did. They were nonviolent. And I was starting to think, "Well, I don't know." So, but you, 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 uh, you well, gave a well, different perspective. Well, it might be so, but. I mean, the, yeah. The thing right. is, once you look at them and you see that they, they have longboats and they're doing yeah, writing and exactly. they, they have celestial navigation, the guys are making maps and shit like that. So once you say that, 
then you know that they've had contact with Sumeria. I, I don't buy this bullshit that civilization, you know, started up in nine different places just, you know, independently. It's like it's complete horseshit. They, they, they must have contact. They, they're global sailors. So, so civilization starts, you know, around Gebekli Tepe and, Su and Suma. But what, what, what's been going around the world is, is trade. So the guys are learning to, to trade, and then basically they're learning to write. So the first use of writing in Samaria is for contracts. It's basically an indelible witness. And the next thing is used, it's used for is bureaucracy, in particularly tax recording. So the very first time they, they use it for literature, it's kind of a very, very novel use of, you know, it's kind, it's kind of like if you got QuickBooks and started writing music on it or something, people would be like, wow, who knew you could get QuickBooks or a spreadsheet and make music out of it? So um, it's, it's a real departure to try and tell stories. But when, when, you know, once, once they got sophisticated enough with a bureaucrat bureaucratic language, then they could start writing stories. But anybody that's got writing, they didn't come up with that independently. There's no fucking way. It, I, I just think anthropologists don't know what the fuck they're talking about. And it, you, you can, you, you, if you just look, I, I, anybody that's really interested in this, I encourage you to look at an animation of how civilizations start. And you can see with your freaking eye that basically it's going like a disease vector. So if, you know, if apocalypse wasn't coming and we had infinite time, I would, I would definitely do some computer modeling to prove that it would be, um, that, that it is, uh, civilization is spreading like a disease vector. It's, it, it cannot be, you know, starting independently in South America and then China. If you, if you look at it start in Suma, it spreads just like, you know, like exactly like you can look at COVID spreading today. It spreads exactly that way. So it's it's like it's it's inconceivable that it's it's happening independently. But you see, the reason why they say it's happening independently is again this kind of uh, millenarian argument that they're trying to use for the progressives are trying to use for Easter Island is that it, like civilization is in inevitable. It's manifest destiny. You know, civilization is good and it's an achievement that everybody will get to. And as they know, it's a fucking disease and it's fucking spread from Suma. So it, it's it's a political. The re, the anthropologists have to have have to ignore the obvious that civilization is spreading like a disease. Well, it's trade, not civilization. It's trade, is uh, and trading places. The concept of having a trading place uh, is 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 what's spreading. And so, you know, they can't have that because it undermines you know Gordon Child and freaking Marx and surplus and all this bullshit story about civilization is good um and and so they have to undermine it yeah if it if it has a single point origin it's terrible for like you know left a uh, liberal for the liberal left academia because they have to say you know shit this comes from white people <laughs> like you see and then they say well, we can't say that, you know, all this good stuff just came from white people. And say, no, you can, because it's bad stuff. Just say, <laughs> you, you get a complete clean bill of health from wokeism because you say, like, it's, it's civilization's evil. It came from white people. <laughs> so yeah, there you are. Stop colonization means stop white people, stop civilization. Yeah, it's like they, they coat the cancer with sugar so it goes down better. <laughs> And it, it only works if you start indoctrinating the kids early, right? If, if they, it's kind of like Christianity. If you get all the kids before seven and you start telling them how wonderful civilization is, they don't question it later, even, you know, given the evidence of their eyes. So, so eventually, kids are shooting up the schools in that, but they don't even make the connection why they're doing it, because civilization is evil and they know, it, they know that the situation is intolerable. And they're fighting back against it. But some of those school shooters still will say, you know, civilization's great. Well, if civilization's great, why are you shooting up the school? Ah, because of the schools. <laughs> it's like, no, school is an intimate part of civilization. Civilization would fall apart without early schooling. 
Yeah, it's uh, they have to deprive you of like you know spiritual needs like your rite of passage, um, community. So that way you're like a little black hole that has to consume. Yeah. Yeah, what, what they call it socialization, but it's a, it's a complete abuse of the term because socialization was done in a tribe. It's socialization used to be tribalization. So they get all panicky now saying, oh, you know, all these kids have missed a year of school. And then they use this euphemism saying, oh, they're not being socialized. They're saying like, well, yeah, that's a gift to them. They, they're not being indoctrinated is what, what's happening. They're not, they're not being pacified and they're not being domesticated. And if, uh, if that happens, the whole, you know, concentration camp collapses. Damn good thing if they kept them out of school. <laughs> Yeah, and also the workplace. Um, I just realized uh, in my workplace they had um, active shooter training, and they always bring in a, a sheriff every year to, to do some training. And they, and they what did they say? A run, hide, fight is their <laughs> motto. Yeah. It's funny you bring that up because I had that at my workplace too. Active shooter training. Oh boy. How how to be an active shooter? Uh -huh. <laughs> kind of. No, uh, no, please, it's, it's to uh, I know. prevent. It's the opposite. Yeah, it's dumb. It's kind of like anti-harassment <laughs> -harass training is anti-harassment training. Our city, um, yeah, the police is always offering um, those sessions, uh, but I never go. Um, but isn't it funny that all these people that are, you know, transhumanists, futurists, and they, you know, millenarians, they love progress. And they, they'll tell you, oh, they, you know, if you live in a primitive lifestyle, in a tribal lifestyle, then, you know, it's full of, like, bears running out. It's dangerous it's, and stuff. And you think, like, really? I think this city is far more dangerous. I think a bear is much more predictable than a human being. <laughs> so, so that, again, it's inverted worldview. I don't think people like Native Americans, yeah, I was just reading in, like, bright green lies the that some in some of these areas uh, like in the columbia river you know up in the northwest uh that if you canoed down the when the first white settlers came uh to to washington they they if you canoed down the columbia river you would see a brown bear about every 15 minutes so it's it's like inconceivable that grizzly bears are you know, just ripping people's faces off left and right. But there, there were, there were things like if you see Lewis and Clark and look at their diaries, then they came along the Columbia River and they, they were big grizzlies, much bigger than they are today. Really scary ones, and they did chase them. They did chase the Lewis and Clark. Um, but you, when you read it, you get the impression that they kind of dopes. They don't really know you know, understand a grizzly. I don't believe that the Native American people had trouble with grizzlies like Lewis and Clark did. They kind of have the wrong attitude and they, they, you know, they're kind of like city folk <laughs> they're messing with, with giant grizzlies. Oh, that's funny you bring that up. I saw something earlier that was pretty great. So like, you know, I think like uh, predator animals like grizzlies will like test you and see if you're gonna like run. So this guy was like standing here. I was watching this YouTube video that like says like guy gets chased by grizzly. I'm like, okay, fuck it, I'll see this. And uh, the grizzly charges him, but he runs at the grizzly screaming, and that grizzly bear turns around immediately and goes back to the woods. But the uh, way yeah, that so, guy screamed was like a roar. So <laughs> yeah, so so this is something we were taught in Africa. It's basically in Africa you don't assume that. You know, even in the 30s and stuff, uh, my, my dad and stuff was traveling all over Africa when it was really like there were headhunters and stuff. And they, you know, they had lots of stories, but, you know, very seldom that somebody like like Livingston was attacked by a lion. If you read uh, Jack London and Jock of the Bushveld and those things, the, he was attacked by a lion, but it's generally when they're on a horse. And so what we were always taught as kids is you must stand your ground when if you're, if you're charged by almost any animal. And the reason is if you turn and run, you'll trigger a fixed action response. So a cat is, is primed. They can't help it. 
if, if you know whether they're hungry or whatever if they see a running thing they, they'll run it down because it's an innate fixed action response and you've got to be very careful to trigger that it's very it's it's easy to to do something that that then you know the the cat in particular will will go hang on a minute this is a bit off script i don't understand what this behavior is they, they will back off because it's not um it's not not anything that they understand so if if you bang a pot or something it's like completely off its repertoire and it goes like Shit, I'm not getting involved in this. <laughs> and also, if you stand your ground, I mean, I know lots of people that uh, were charged by lions and stuff, and they, they just stood the ground. My grand just stood her ground against a leopard and something, and just just went, <laughs> the thing just took off. But yeah, it's it's just we we're just so divorced from from nature. It, it's it's a struggle. I mean. I tell you, I'm, uh, I must admit that I'm taking awful strain with, with the, you know, just people and their psych psychology. It just does, it was wearing me down at the moment. And uh, the, I mean, one of the things was the talk to Kevin. And I just thought, you know, I, it, the things I take for granted, but I then realize later that really people don't know the basics. So, I mean, just the thing about the ocean and the fact that the ocean is fundamental. All life on Earth is built on the ocean. But, you know, here's a guy, doctor, well-educated, smart guy, and he doesn't fucking know that life on land could disappear in a heartbeat and nothing would happen and the sea would, sea would get better. But, but he doesn't know that, like, life on land is dependent on the sea. The sea's not a dumping ground. And... and and then it's like I just I just thought everybody knew this, and the fact that people don't is just like oh wait we're screwed <laughs> we're so screwed. Yeah, what have they been teaching people in school? I don't know. Do you think your education in South Africa was really? It seems like, you know, like to use a term, it's, you're like a Renaissance man. Like you have classical training, but you're good with computers and engineering and math. So but, but maybe it was a lack of uh, education we got in Africa. That that's the difference. It was a it, it, the difference was there was a lack of education. So so we you see we never had television, and that that was a huge boon for education. So if if you want to educate your kids, the first thing to do is get rid of all the screens. Uh, if you just chuck them all out. That, so there there a few guys afloat that I know, families afloat, um, that were uh, two families, one from Germany, one from Sweden in particular, and one from Canada. All, all three of them were educated. They, they were teachers, right? Some some one parent, some both parent, but they were all educated, and they all, all had kids. And they, okay, they did allow screens, but for like an hour a day, they really limited the, the screen time. And the kids reminded me of my childhood. They had a real childhood. But you can only learn stuff, you know, like physics and how the world works and stuff by going out in nature and trying shit out. You, you've, got to, you've got to take on a bit of danger, you know. I mean, the, the, shit, the shit I did as a kid, you know, lighting fires and making bombs and making guns and just... It was a complete adventure with wild animals and shit all the time. We were just do, just doing mischief all the time. And it was dangerous as fuck, you know, compared to how kids are brought up now. But we were very savvy. <laughs> you know, I was about a million times more savvy than, than kids today. You know, I, I mean, like my American kids. So, so it's, it's, education is really, really punishing kids. Because there's, they're not learning anything, right? If, if you, what do you learn in in school up until high school that you use? Nothing. Very very little. I like, I saw this. Um, I think it was that Rand Prier. I linked that video months ago when he talked about the schooling system. He said they basically just teach you to juggle abstractions in a sterile room, and it's like, yeah, that's true. <laughs> yep. So it's basically worthless. Well, well, they they have a 
okay, nefarious agenda. One of them is they, they're teaching you to sit still, they're teaching you to be obedient, they putting you in a in streaming you into a hierarchy. Um, they they're encouraging the kids to haze each other. Uh, it's it's terrible, terrible child abuse. The school system is is ritualized child abuse. But you know, you can't tell that to an educator today. But those those sailing guys, they were recalled to Sweden, the ones who both parents were educators. They, they were recalled to Sweden because Sweden has um, kind of a long arm on their citizens. It doesn't matter if you're abroad or something, they'll keep tabs on you. And so they made them come back to Sweden because they said basically they're abusing the kids because they're keeping the kids out of school. And so they, you know, they said, no, we're teaching them here and stuff. And they said, well, you're not going to the curriculum. They're missing all these standardized tests and stuff. And so they have to come back. Um, and so they said, okay, well, we'll bring them back and we'll you test them and then you see. Um, and so they tested them. <laughs> they were really, sh they shut themselves because the kids were so far advanced. They were like nine and 10 year olds. They, you know, they, they'd play with all these other kids that are French and German and <laughs> English and stuff. And so they could speak five languages fluently. And then, you know, they're doing mathematics, they knew sailing, they could navigate, they, they had read all these books and stuff. And they were flawed. They were like, these kids are like university educated 10 year olds and say, that's what you get if you just take them out of the system. But the, the guys were furious because it showed up the system. So, so the Canadian woman, she went, she had a kid with Down syndrome. And so the, 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 in Canada, they asked her to start lecturing and tell her how she made her kids so advanced. They told her that her kid who had Down syndrome would, would never pass the mental age of a five-year-old. And so then she, you know, said, well, screw this. She's not keeping them in a home. She's going to take the kid to see and have a life. And so, you know, the kid just played with all the other kids, you know, 10 year olds and stuff. And, you know, the, all the other kids just accepted her with Down syndrome. She, they didn't treat her any, you know, specially or anything like that. They looked after if she got into trouble. But when she got back to Canada, they said, you know, this is incredible. She said, basically, the, the, they've never seen a kid with Down syndrome so advanced. And so she said, well, yeah, it's all I did was not keep her in a home and give her special, you know, special needs, you know, uh, care. She just let them run around on the yacht and on the beach and on a, you know, with the other kids and just tag along with whatever they were doing. You see, a, a kid with Down syndrome, if you're teaching the others maths or something, then they will try and fit in. They'll try and get a pencil and try and write and stuff. So it's like... It's so bad what we're doing to kids. It's just so fucking bad. And then, then they're starting to shoot the schools up and no one says, you know, questions the system that they're shooting up. It's like, guys, you stop talking about disarming people and stuff. Stop that shit. You got to question why we're sending kids to school. If they're shooting the school up saying, you know, what, is, what do we think we're doing? The, <laughs> I mean, if, if you put like tigers in a cage or something and they they started tearing you know zookeepers apart or something you, you know somebody's got to sit down and say maybe we shouldn't be keeping them in a cage but it's like no one says that is that like you've got to stop this bullshit and, and say we need to abolish schools the schools are schools are the problem it's not the guns it's not the kids it's nothing it's the school so it's, it's terrible man we, we just got to liberate these kids somehow <laughs> Yeah, I'm in total agreement. Having experienced the U.S. schooling system and seeing, you know, the, the decay today and how bad it's getting, yeah, uh, I just, I wish the society would go sane, but I don't see it getting there, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, there's too much regimentation. And I didn't grow up here, but I hear stories from friends about how high school was really, really hard for them um, because... Uh, well, just a lot of the bullying and, um, yeah, that's, um, I guess, it, I don't know. <laughs> I grew up elsewhere and um, we, we did have regimentation too, but 
um, we had a strong we had strong family connections, so it was an extended family setting. Um, whereas my American cousins who grew up here, um, they were called latchkey kids. So they lived in the suburbs. They would come home. They'll be by themselves, and when they come home, they would just turn on the TV until the parents came home at night um, to cook supper. So um, I don't. Maybe they played with other kids, but it was more like regimented sports too, like baseball or soccer. So they didn't really have pickup games where children, like where I grew up, you know, you just go out in the street and you play with whomever you meet. Yeah, you know, um, yeah, we used to just play with anybody. And we, we weren't supervised all the time. And I, and I noticed with my kids was, Kids are not, you know, they have an adult looking over them. They chaperone 24 hours a day until they're like 18. And as, as I, we, we never had that. If, if we got into trouble, you know, we'd have to run and find an adult. It wouldn't be, wouldn't be easy. Most of the shit we had to handle ourselves. You know what I mean? And, it, and, and we did. It's like I, I remember my, yeah, I was like seven. My sister was nine. We, we were making making toffee in the in the oven but it was a gas oven we forgot to lit, light the oven so you know when when we finally realized oh shit we switched the oven on but we forgot to light it we <laughs> went and lit the oven and my i just had this mental picture of my sister being blown completely <laughs> across, across the kitchen and she, she was completely black all her hair was burnt off oh my and and, and we didn't even think of calling an adult. We I just handled it. We went and I, you know, dressed all her wounds and bathed them, and oh my just, gosh. We, we didn't we didn't think that it was necessary to call an adult. But can you imagine that now? It's like basically they'd call nine one one and it'd be she'd be in hospital. But it's it's unnecessary. It's entirely unnecessary. Yeah, but they, it, that's one of the things is people. People go with this because they don't want risk. And then they're also going off this paradigm that, oh, they're going to miss out. You know, basically they'll fall behind in the race. You know, the kids, they look at all the statistics and kids' earnings, you know, if, don't, if they don't have a degree, they, they'll be screwed and stuff. And so it's it's like, nah, it's, it doesn't, it has, this century, since since 2000, the evidence has been the opposite. Is is better, you're better off with doing something you like, reducing stress, and not not having a degree. And and but nobody will communicate that. Although the researchers know that, they they won't communicate it because <laughs> it just goes so counter to our culture. Yeah, they, they I did that. Evidence. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, no. Go ahead. Okay, yeah, so I was, I was going to say that I did the math on this years ago about the economy and the rat race and all that shit, and I'm like, no, I'm, I don't think I'm going to have retirement. The mortgages are expensive. Fuck this. I'm going to do art. <laughs> yeah, and it, you see, if you can reduce your stress, that's the most important thing. But, yeah, it's yeah, it's it's so bad what where we've got to the the reason why all the kids are are hazing each other and yeah you know, bullying and stuff is because it's a prison yard it's the school system i went through was a prison yard and uh, it's 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 terrible that we've we've made a system where we you know in, incarcerate kids against against their will um but and it's so unnecessary because like in germany they still believe in having, you know, kids having a childhood. So kids don't do pre-K or anything. They just basically, till the age of seven, they just run around being kids, playing in the park and stuff like that. And they don't do teach them reading or writing or anything. In the, in the UK, it's getting earlier and earlier. They're doing pre-K now. It's like four-year-olds, three-year-olds are learning to you know, count and read and stuff because everybody's terrified they'll fall back. But the amazing thing is that the German kids don't start doing anything that a three-year-old, three or four-year-old English kid does until they're seven or eight. When they're eight years old, they catch up instantly. So the, and, and even here's the, here's the real kicker. 
is that they exceed them. They quickly exceed them. So they do. They just play around until seven, and then until they're seven years old. Then they stop the curriculum that they start in the UK at like three, and within a few years they overtake them. <laughs> so, so it's like, even though educators have all this information at their fingertips, they can't go against the society. They they can't go against this this cult cult belief that we have. Yeah, it's just a, a messed up thing. Like, especially in America, I feel like people have completely forgotten the value of play. Like, why people need to understand, like, why are little kids playing? Well, you know, we're supposed to be hunter gatherers, so they're supposed to figure out what food they're supposed to be eating or looking at, playing in the grass, you know, checking out the environment and all that. Yeah, you're supposed to be building up that mental map. But instead, you know, it's like, no, we're going to. We're going to fill that mental map full of things that they're not going to be able to use. And no wonder things are going to shit. Yeah, I've, I, my theory on education is you can't actually teach somebody something until they have a question. So the, the art of, of pedagogy is to, is to try and make people have a question. And so if you have, have kids, you, you just have to, you know, try and set up a situation where they've got to say, that's weird. And then ask a question. And as soon as they ask a question, it demands another one and another one. And that's how education happens. But this idea that you just open the lid on people's scalp and fill it full of concrete like they, they have in our education system is, is, is just so wrong. All the, you know, the evidence is against it. Until somebody actually has a question, you can't actually do anything. And, and now they teach kids not to have questions. <laughs> <laughs> it's, they, they actually punish kids for, for questioning. So in in my school, I was, you know, we were roundly punished for questioning and asking too much. But but it didn't stop us because we were like really rebellious against against the system. And so, you know, we used to take take the you know the teachers to task asking questions, trying to embarrass them. But. They don't do that anymore. There's, I think in university now there's an entente cordiale where they, you know, the, the lecturers don't give the students any trouble and in exchange the students don't, don't give the lecturers any trouble and then they both just, you know, give each other a passing grade and then just carry on. So, so it's, got, it's got to the stage where the Soviet Union got to. It's the educational equivalent of, you know, we pretend to work and they pretend to pay us. Kind of like where academia is now, I think. But uh, so, yeah. so anyway, I, I wanted to, to say something about the uh, to change the topic. Has anybody got any more to say on this topic? Oh, I think we've nailed it. Yeah, yeah I mean, I the tr the trick is now is just you know get people to question the school system, and so we can throw it out someday, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. cultural no check. But so, yeah, the, it would help if at least somebody somewhere thought differently. But so, yeah, um, so I was thinking of that um, Stephen Fry and Jordan Peterson conversation that they had. Um, and there was something that Stephen Fry mentioned, which I was really interested in, because I remember the experiment he was talking about. He was talking about something which he credited to Skinner, but I didn't think it was Skinner. And I went looking for it to try and find who, who did the experiment. And I couldn't find it anywhere. So if anybody knows who, who it is or can track it down, I, I really want to know. It's basically the one where he was talking about this experiment they did with rats. They put a glass, you know, they basically get a raft um, made of perspex. And they floated on water. And all the rats keep stabilized because they just go around randomly. And, you know, if they're all jiggling around randomly, um, they don't tip the, 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 they don't tip the, uh, the raft over, even though they can see they're imperiled over the water. Now, when they scale that up and put people on it, people don't last long. They go straight in the water very quickly. And the reason is because people realize that they're in peril and they all start running around and they start overcompensating. They all start running to this side and then realize they've overcooked it and run to the other side. And so 
people being aware of their situation. The, the, the rats aren't really aware of their, their peril, so they just run around normally. But what the experiment's designed to show is being aware of the peril is actually um, really, really bad for your chances because it means you overcompensate. And so uh, Stephen Fry was making the same argument that I was making with the helicopter saying, you know, we've got to learn to let go because all these systems work. And what we're doing with everything on a planet-wide scale, and soon we're going to start geoengineering, but all these transhumanists that are trying to micromanage us, and it still goes into the school system and, you know, this regimentation, is trying to get control and trying to manage it, just like the pandemic. And that's what Stephen Fry was talking about was the pandemic, is that if you try and do that, you're going to screw it up because it's a complex system. And you, you can't, as we were talking about in the, the other day, you can't manage a complex system with a simple little thing like an alien cortex. And so, so all the evils in the world is trying to keep control of complexity. And so, you know, and then you get in these cycles. Oh, Boris Johnson totally screwed it up, you know, because he mismanaged the whole thing. It's like, guys, there isn't a way to manage it. And the guys cannot not manage it. Because as soon as somebody in power says, like, okay, best thing of all, to just let it run its course. People will howl. They say, like, well, you've broken the social contract. You're supposed to keep us safe. They say, I, you know, Boris Johnson should say, I'm keeping you safe. It's a complex system. Basically, the safest thing to do is not fuck with it. And, but people wouldn't accept it. So people demand that these guys start controlling it. It inevitably goes south. And then they start scapegoating the guys. And so, so nobody has the option to do nothing. So if they wanted to teach kids something in schools, they should teach this to get to let have them let go and teach them the value of you know being hands off. Um, and so yeah, but they don't. They they teach them oh you know we're going to get control and everything. The underlying um, sort of message that comes across from science and all these sub STEM subjects is you know is this thing from like Hilbert. Uh, you know, ignoramus, uh, you know, that quote, you know, we can know, we must know. Uh, yeah, we will know. Ignoramus, ignoramus. No, ignoramus, ignoramus. Yeah, so that um, that's the message that we're reinforcing in these kids. And then, then you come to, you know, today where you look on Reddit, you see Futurology has like 15, almost 16 million subscribers. As they like, and then you see Collapse as like, yeah, you know, like a fraction of that. But, the, but you, you can see why is because they've told the kids that, you know, this is our narrative is we're conquering nature, we're getting control, we, we are supreme. And so this human supremacy narrative, even though everything says it's not working, everything says if you look at all the great triumphs of all, you know, look, look how aid worked out in Africa. They cite the devastation in Africa to all the aid and United Nations programs that were designed to lift people out of poverty and to, you know, stop the advance of the Sahel and all of that kind of thing. And all of those now are cited as uh, the advance of the Sahara. It was the exact opposite happened. But nobody says anything. All that shit that happened when I was a kid, of all that they were, we were told, oh, you know, they're going to transform Africa, get control of the Sahara, it will feed everybody. In and it's like the opposite happened, and they cite the, the aid programs of that era. But they don't teach it to kids. The, the Green Revolution, they teach them the Green Revolution and stuff. They don't tell them the effect of the Green Revolution has been an unmitigated disaster. If you see the, the effect of the Green Revolution in the Punjab, th those guys are militant and, you know, they want reparations for that. But nobody says anything. We go on to the next, uh, you know, EcoHealth and the United Nations and WEF. They're still on the same shit that is proven to not work time and time again. 
and they don't teach this to the kids. They're still teaching the kids all this carry sherry green new deal shit. And they, they don't, you know, say like, you guys, you got to stop this shit, man. But nobody teaches that. Yeah, you know, I feel like the whole, um, I think it's the, the agriculture system is like Herbert Bosch process and green revolution. I feel like that was just civilization knuckling down, you know, because they, they were coming to the limits of agriculture and they scienced up agriculture to do that. And I feel like that was just like civilization knuckling down. Oh, we can make this work. And it's like, no, we should have pulled our heads out of our asses back then. <laughs> yeah. In fact, the Harbor Bosch process is actually geoengineering. It's basically nitrogenizing the soil is, is, is geoengineering. You don't want to say that too loud because there's, we're about to enter a phase of massive, massive geoengineering. And it's going to be the end of us because you can say it with certainty because you can look at the previous ecological disasters and any, any kind of th planetary large scale thing that goes ma management you know that it's it's going to be a disaster. I mean, there hasn't been. I, I want to see anything you can show me that has lasted for over 100 years and has been managed and hasn't turned out to be a disaster. And I can't think of any anything of any decent scale or even a micro scale. You, even if you said, oh, your grandma's garden has been managed for 100 years and that's fine. But no, it's been denuding somebody, she's getting the fertilizer from somewhere. She's using pesticides, she's doing, you know, basically, you know <laughs> that she's, if she's managing it, she's taking, you know, entropy from somewhere else to keep her little patch order. And saying, well, you know, it's basically keeping order is counterproductive in a complex system. So, that, I mean, it's provable. So I, I have no doubt that that's, you know, this, this geoengineering is going to be a disaster. But here we go on a on a vast scale uh, of doing this geoengineering, and why it's dangerous is why it's dangerous to mention something like the Harbour Bosch process is geoengineering because a lot of these weasels, like David Keith, who should be shot as soon as possible, is uh, is they saying. You know, well, we've been doing geoengineering. Climate change is geoengineering. We've been geoengineering for 5,000 years. So it's fine. It's like, listen to yourself. We're doing geoengineering to fix the cock ups of all this geoengineering. So, all, you know, so, you know we've got to stop moving earth and we've got to stop mining water and we've got to stop constructing. And, uh, but, these guys are going to double down on it now. Like the Harbor Bosch process, they're going to double down. And so the massive geoengineering projects are coming. And they're, they're frankly insane because, you know, just read Dark Green Lies. I mean, Bright Green Lies. Dark Green Lies, there's a Freudian slip. <laughs> but the, it's going to be dark. It's going to be des desperately dark. And, the, the you know, if you read that, it's sort of stuff which no one wants to face things like um you know wind farms actually increase the local temperature so it's like whoever says that you know it's like it's it's not all about desert tortoises and joshua trees it's 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 ah uh, i i mean the the cure that we're trying to do for all the ills that the alien cortex has done is to just double down on the alien cortex. And you say, well, when when are people going to lose hope? When are they going to stop this dysfunctional behavior? And it's when they really get hurt. It's, and even then, they're not going to let go. Yeah, it's like yeah. even when an alcoholic, you know, hits rock bottom, they can still die from their addiction. So, yeah, it's not very good. Yeah, I don't have a very good view of what's coming next, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, well, this, this was another thing which was depressing me after that conversation with Kevin in the ocean is, is, is I think there's a, especially on the environmentalist side, is this, this quaint notion that if we just leave everything alone, it'll come back. And that, 
that also I thought people didn't. I was disappointed that people didn't know that that is true up to a point, but uh, there's a tipping point where it doesn't come back. So now if I look in the, the seas and stuff now, I've come back tremendously. Just, just this afternoon, I saw these two mother big fish un under the boat, and it was like, wow, that's all come in a year. So, so then, you know, a lot of greens are thinking, you know, oh, you know, just you know, and anarcho primitivists and stuff thinking we just need to stop and everything will come back and say we, we're at the brink, right? So the oceans do not just come back. If it, it depends on how hot they are, the pH, and there's lag. There's 10 years of lag. So you, you will see, that, you know, the temperature goes up and a lot of these species will all be female. They'll die off every last one. It's, it's not like, oh, there'll be some niche where there's no. It, you can get to the point, and it's normally in this kind of web, is 50%. But if if the pH changes and the and the temperature goes up together, could be it for all life in the sea. It's not going to come back. Fish are not going to come back. They will go. There are a lot of them. You know, it's it's basically if you look at how sensitive the whole thing is, it seems robust because it's. It's robust um, because it's dynamically stable up to a point. It's just like a boat. You, you know, if you if you rock a boat, it looks like it's really stable. You can, you know, you, if you're not really naive, you can, you know, get a boat to heel over, and you can say like, "Look, it's really stable. Look at it going back," and say like, "Watch this. Take it to this point. And at some point, it goes, and then it's very tipping on ways which way it's going to tip." And if it tips this way, it's stable in the other direction, upside down. And so that's where the planet is. We're at the tipping point. And all these people saying, yeah, but it's all tipped before and it's all robust. And it's like, no, we're absolutely on the tip. In fact, I think we passed the tip in, in 2020. I think we're doing. Yeah, not only that, but people also consider like what what's going on with the civilization the damage it's doing is akin to the meteor from the dinosaurs and like the great dying and that shit took like 30 million years to even start recovering the biodiversity so i wish people would realize that that we've done tens of millions of years of damage to the biodiversity of the planet and it's like not even clear if there's going to be any complex life after we're through with it yeah i think i think Environment, a lot of environments are way too sanguine. There's like v Venus was uh, an Earth-like planet, right? And it it sterilized itself, boiled off its ocean just because of CO2. So I, I have no time for these guys that say, "Well, oh, but if you go back in history, there were worse times." And stuff like, no, there, there's more CO2 in the air now than for for the last 40 million years. So it's like, don't come with this bullshit. <laughs> and anyway, it's not CO2 that gets us, it's methane. And so we've never had a period where the methane runs away. So the, all, all these models and that all squiffy because they all have, you know, all the plants come in to take advantage of the CO2 and say, no, that isn't what happens when you do it really fast. It's, it's like the models are like, you know, modeling saying, you know, I can shoot you once a year and you'll easily last five years because you can recover from each bullet wound but if i shoot you five times one morning you're doomed and that's you see all the models are all long stretched out things and and then they're finding time and time again that they don't work like this so, so all the tundra was supposed to get green as, as the Arctic melted, the tundra was supposed to green. And all the foliage comes out, and then that would counterbalance it. And they're finding out, no, the thermocast means it's just dark. It's concrete. <laughs> when, when, when the thing melts, there's no vegetation. It's like a, you know, it's like an asphalt, you know, asphalt runway. So, so then, you know, each one of these things, they check off all their delusions. And you say, like, guys, you can see what's happening. <laughs> so yep, I think... Yeah, exactly. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. 
but but I think we would have to react right now. We would have to stop industrial civilization, like you know, right now. It's basically have stop everything, and just just everybody just you know, every, all electricity and stuff should be brought down, and uh, you know, stop tr uh, transporting fossil fuels and stuff. And then, you know, yeah, that's what I think it would take. It's it, these ideas. Oh, we can be net neutral by 2030, 2050. Is like, mm -mm. Uh -uh, we're done for. It's like anyway. um, when we talked to Jerry Jensen that one time, we were talking about how uh, people are just going to rationalize what they want to do anyway. And this whole bright green bullshit they're doing with, oh, we can get net zero while running industrial civilization. It's just that, you know, rationalizing what they want to do anyway, even if it's obviously bullshit, which is really depressing. Yeah, so the only thing I can think of to do is to try and, you know, just talk a bit of sense, like, and, you know, put it on YouTube so, like, 10 people see. <laughs> but, yeah, the forces are, are a bit too big, and um, there, 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 are, there are many people that are working to change things i mean proper things and i think i mean i'm i'm have people in mind like jeff hull and those kind of guys that kind of what what singles those guys out is they've got a lot of um apparently a lot of psychological processing under their belt and so for most people it takes a long time for you to figure this stuff out and so for most people i think that they haven't realized, you know, they're still on the baby steps thinking, oh, well, it's a technical problem. We can use an engineering fix. You've got to get through that. That might take you 10 years. A lot of people don't get through that in their lifetime. But eventually you get to a point where you say that this is a psychological problem. This is exactly like an alcoholic. And then, you know, you start from there and, you know, you might be, might take you three decades to figure that out. And then, then you've got to start working on the problem. So, so there are a few people that realize what the problem is and realize that it's psychology, um, but precious few people know how to how to change it. And you know, I think I think you know we're on the right track with a with an arg an alternate reality game, and saying you you can't reason with people, but you have to start a, a game and start making it fun to you know to, to change and then that it that could spread um, and, and could actually go viral these things do go viral quite fast I mean QAnon I saw that they, they're really reckon it's as big as a major religion that only took two years so the you know it's possible to to do these kind of things but you know I I really struggle to get people to at, at this stage I really struggle to get people to even hear anything against science or against technology or futurology and, and that's just the basics even even stuff against the internet or the grid or ju just talking against it let alone at, you know basically getting to the stage where people need to get militant against these things yeah so I like, think oh go ahead yeah, no no sorry I was going to say, I think the main problem with this is like, you know, experience, personal experience. Um, most people haven't a f probably thought about the grid and science and all that in a different way. And B probably haven't really at least been conscious of negative experiences and to their health from it. So it's I think it's a uh, I hate this word, but it's an awareness issue, I think. Uh, a cognitive awareness issue of seeing the negatives of these things. Yeah. Yeah, and like I was saying, is like people are, are gonna react when they get hurt. Right. I think yes, yeah, it's, it's it's awareness, but I think more importantly is they've they've gotta see these things go down, like the grid, they gotta see things actually collapsing or actually hurting them. That I mean you're 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 on the right track here and it's tough because there's a lot of this nonviolence and uh, that, it's tough. It's it's a tough position. Yeah, non non violence is an expensive luxury at this stage.
I yeah. think it's also um, brainwashing, distractions. Uh, people are just um, going round and round and round the merry-go-round or the Ferris wheel, and they're not really analyzing um, how how our current lifestyles, uh, like we all know, are very stressful. And um, and they think that okay, let's double down. You know, like I will work harder, I will work faster, I will, um, you know, use all the technological tools, and then and then you know, then I'll be better if I if I do that. It's it's not stopping to think. Um, what are we doing this all for? Yeah, I remember one of your videos. You. Uh, this was brilliant. I think this is like the crux of this issue. So you're talking about in terms of like system science and like the hierarchy, how what they do is like, as you get up in the hierarchy, you have more options, you know, so they like for the for us slaves, they put us through schooling, they basically put blinders on us of a you know, like what they've done, all the they've taken away from us. And what we're allowed to think, what we're allowed to question, but as you get up, you have more options to maneuver. You know what I'm saying? I think I can't remember which of your videos it was, but yeah, I think that's yeah. the main thing. They put freaking mule blinders on you when you're like in the schooling system. You can't see shit. Yeah, yeah. That that's been my experience through through life. Is is you're better off getting higher up in the hierarchy than you can do more damage against it. <laughs> so. I, yeah, I've always tried to to rise up the the hierarchy so you can you can really sabotage it. But yeah, um, yeah, I mean, I I'm I have no status in this hierarchy. So I, but I uh, yeah, I wonder. You know, I keep on. Yeah, see, there, there are guys out there that um, you know do have status in the hierarchy and at some stage they're going to realize that that we need to make a change and then you know i i, I feel that we have I, I feel personally that i have a lot to offer in, the, in in actually doing change because you know because i see it in terms of alternate reality gaming and a, and a cult um so you know i think that's Personally, that's uh, something I feel comfortable about knowing, <laughs> knowing how how cuts run and how how to do them. Um, but I'm feeling a little bit at the moment that there's uh, it's kind of one of those stopping points where you just where there's no movement, and then you just in, in those times, like in the I Ching, so you just have to prepare. So it's basically so. So when there's no movement, nothing, nothing. So nothing works unless you have good timing. You can't really force any of these things. You just have to take uh, take the opportunity. But at at times, slow times, which I think we're going into another one now, especially because we're coming out of COVID. Um, in in their minds, even though I don't think we are, we have we have like a summer where everybody has a false sense of hope and then by the winter reality will bite is what i what i predict um so and also the financial situation and stuff so i think that you know what you're supposed to do in these times according to all the wisdom everywhere is prepare so at these these times you've got to um you know get ready for when these things turn around then you've got to got to react but but i feel that it's one of those stages where we are on the back step of the dance. So if you look at like guys like Roger Hallam and stuff, they just went through burning pink and then, you know, Valerie didn't really shape in the mayoral elections in London, which was what they were hoping for. But I can't see anything from Roger anymore. There's no videos. <laughs> it's gone very, very quiet. <laughs> and, so, and so I'm thinking, he must be feeling pretty down. I don't. I don't imagine he's tooling away somewhere. Yeah, but, I feel. I feel Roger's pain. <laughs> yeah, it's I, very I feel, lonely. It's very freaking yeah. lonely. I, I. I do too. I, I can feel that pain. And Have you had any luck um, connecting with him? Because I. I heard that. Uh, well, that you were wanting to connect with him. 
Um, yeah. Has, has his uh, yeah. Have his people responded to you or? Uh, not to me, to Gary. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Gary's, yeah, Gary's trying to organize something. Yeah. That's and so, good to hear. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, yeah. But I feel it's perfect timing because, you know, it would be nice to talk to him when he's feeling completely on the ropes. <laughs> Because, you see, it's a, it's a good time when when everybody is despondent because then they can they can hear. They they're not very good at listening when they're having success, and so you can't tell them, "Oh, the success is not going to last" or something like that, like extinction rebellion. Very easy to see where they're going to go, wind up, but they're not going to listen because they they're too drunk on on success. And, but at a, at a point like this, um, it is one of those inflection points where you could influence people. It's one of those neutral points where everybody's kind of defeated for a little bit and then, you know, activists and stuff. And then, then you have a, an option to, to actually get some, some change because, or set a new direction because, because they can hear you when they're down. And so, yeah. But I, I mean, I think even Derek Johnson and Dear Keith and, and those guys, they must be feeling pretty down. I mean, we're, we're going to talk to Derek Johnson, I think, next Thursday. Right? Oh, no, I think it's Tuesday. Oh, yeah, Tuesday, June 1st. Yeah. yeah. But but I've got a feeling he's going to be pretty down because that AMA that they did on Reddit, that was just mm -hmm. brutal. They just did a, a hit job on him, uh, and on all three of them. But... You know, basically because of trans transgender issues and stuff like that. So, they, they, but it was a it was a hit job, pretty much like happened to Roger Hallam with Desires. It's, it's just so obviously the establishment targeting them. So, I don't I don't I don't think it was, you know, just woke kids and stuff. It might have been. It might have been the detractors just went and, and got them. But I I can almost smell the state operators. You know. It's, uh, I, I, yeah, that's how it looked to me. It, that's how it kind of looked to me. It might have been, you know, like a baby sigh up to to um, drag their names through the mud. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I definitely got the feeling it was pushback against the the message of the book because it's it's like the, the book is so powerful, and and the movie too, and and then you know they've got to come back with some woke nonsense it's like completely irrelevant but it triggers everybody and it's wow that's that stuff is if if it's not a planned psyops we've got to the stage where the, the kids are doing psyops on themselves they've been so well trained they've been been trained to you know it, it could be possible because if you if you get people like in north korea and you know which is just a cult right uh, you can get them to bamboozle themselves. You can train them to indoctrinate themselves. The cult has a very easy time after that because you know people uh, know how to how to self train. If you look at Scientologists and that, they 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 self indoctrinate and they, they self program. And so you can teach people to self program. But what, one of the one of the key things to teaching people to self program is is uh, to keep everything positive. If, it, if ever you come on a, a thing where everybody has to be positive, uh, has to be, you know, negativity is really punished. Um, there's there's a lot of social penalty for, for being down and not being enthusiastic with you know, the program or optimistic. That's generally a key that uh, the, the, there's a cult or some, some kind of um, ruling ideology that comes from a centralized point. And the, the reason they do it, I mean, the reason that happens in a cult is, is that the cult leader, if they're doing anything nefarious, it's very easy not to get scrutiny if nobody's allowed to say anything negative. So if you're doing, you know, just, just saying uh, like, oh, you know, I think the cult leader is a pedophile, then you're like, oh, that's very negative. <laughs> you can't even begin. To basically start undermining it. Oh, you know what you're saying here, like reminds me of like, um, you know, a lot, most of the people I know in my life, 
you know, they're always like, oh, oh, we that's not happy. That should be happy. You know, it's like the pop, it's pop culture. Like what you're describing there is, you know, it's a cult of pop culture. Yeah. Um, to like all culture, the cults are the same and all that. But yeah, like that, that that's the attitude of most people I know. When I say something critical, it's like, why are you being so negative? It's like, that's, I'm not trying to be negative, but. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's keep it light, keep it happy, keep it positive. Why? Yeah. So that nobody can focus on the negative and then basically the guys pulling this pulling all this evil can get away with it because you're not allowed to be negative you can't <laughs> you can't point out what they're doing and then it's, it's like that uh, a sid smith video where he talks about the bunnies and the bunny gets up and is like telling okay guys we got to stop just i'll eat him <laughs> yeah yeah so yeah so yeah you can you can talk with us about all of this, you know, till the, till the cars come on, but at some stage, yeah, I'm hoping we'll, we'll get traction. But anyway, it's, it's really slow, slow going, isn't it? Right. And sometimes you, uh, well, you post those things with hashtags that says it's time or it's too late or something like that. But it's good to hear that you're kind of sang sanguine, sanguine about, um, that it's not too late to do the psychological um, or changes via an ARG um, it, when you cited that QAnon um, went viral quickly. Because I'm just thinking, do we have time? Do we still have time to change the psychological um, aspects or thinking of people? No, we don't have time. I don't, th I don't think we do. I mean, we don't have time to, like, save civilization or stop a mass die-off or stop a whole load of pain or save much of Earth's ecology. We, we haven't got any time for the kind of Ken, Ken Wilber transformation and into this kind of trans, transhumanistic, not transhumanist, uh, uh, transcendent kind of paradise. And so we've we've blown it for that. We, we're in deep shit. We, we're we're in for real real punishment. I don't I don't see we can avoid that. But yeah, but the thing you see in my philosophy, this even if you're going to die tomorrow, even if you, you're facing the firing squad tomorrow, you, the psychology still works today. And it's more than just you know. Even if I was knew I was going to die tomorrow, I'd plant a tree today. You need preparation for death. So, since we all know we're going to die, it's the only certainty. Uh, it's like the Buddhists, you know, they call it a bardo, like a transition. And everybody is in transition. This, What's unavoidable in our world today is no one can avoid the coming transition. What's at stake is what kind of transition it is. So, the, I, I do sympathize with people like Eric Jen, Derek Jensen and stuff with with the um, the transsexuals, because it's it's one of the things that people are saying. Everybody knows there's a transition coming. Our alien cortexes, our collective alien cortexes, know that there's a vast transition coming. It's kind of like birth pains, right? So everybody can feel the birth pangs and they know that there's this dramatic event coming. But then they decide, well, you know, I can see my ego is going to die and I'm transforming to a new one. And then some some narratives say, well, yeah, it's because you're gender dysphoric. So then you can transition to being the opposite sex and be the correct you. And, and so that's a substitution for what I think the transformation is. I think the transformation is psychological. It's basically a transformation out of ego. So it's ego death, it's the death of the alien cortex or the transformation of the alien cortex. But most people are thinking in terms of, it's an external transformation. It's transformation of the social systems. So then you get people in Extinction Rebellion that are thinking more in terms of a transition that's, you know, transition to social uh, climate justice and regenerative society so they think of it as, as a 
so, um, societal transformation. Then you get all the transhumanists and that, and they think it's a transition to post-human. And then it's all machines and order and stuff like that. And so everybody knows that there's a transition. Then Klaus Schwab and all the, those guys, they are the ones that are going to really dictate the transition because they've got all the power. And so they thinking in terms of a transition, that's eugenics. So that they are, so Bill Gates and those guys are unapologetically eugenicists. So I posted that thing with the uh, Epstein-Gates relationship. And Epstein is, is a eugenicist. He, he, he's just like Lindbergh. And Lin, Lindbergh wanted to do exactly what Epstein wanted to do, and that's have a baby from. So these guys are, I think Bill Gates is exactly the same. I think there's a lot of dirt that Epstein must have on, on Bill Gates. But if you look at Bill Gates and all his program, it's, it's a eugenics program. He, they despise the hoi polloi in average person. And in their models, humans are surplus to requirements. The average humans are surplus to requirements. So, when, so Bill Gates says he's going to eliminate poverty. Sure he is. He's going to do it by doing things like impact tokens, by regimenting people, by managing them digitally. So he, he basically, you know, if you, if you, I'm sure if you talk to Bill Gates, he, you know, after a few drinks or something on neutral ground, on safe ground, he would tell you that, you know, the people are poor because they don't have good life skills, they don't have good habits, they, they, they're lazy, and so they need to be managed. They need to be managed like you would manage a, a cow or, you know, a pet. And so people need to be trained. People, you know, have, need thinking done for them. But people are not suited for the alien cortex as well. And so, so he will start off doing all this kind of regimented control. But people will not be managed that way. What these guys don't understand is people want to be free and they want to be natural. They don't want to be controlled and regimented. And so they start to resist. And the easiest form of resistance is malfeasance. So it's not malfeasance, it's um, uh, malingering. So, you know, just like in the Soviet Union, people start to work less, they start to work against the system just because they're obstructive. And so where you will get to with Bill Gates type programs and Klaus Schwab, um, EcoHealth and um, the, 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 you know, One Health, all of those kind of things is where you will get to with them, with them is, is they will lose uh, hope in the even less, they have even less hope in the hoi polloi. And eventually the hoi polloi will look increasingly like a surplus problem. And that's when you get the nasty stuff that like the Germans got to. So if you if you trace all this, if you just get all the bullshit they teach you about Hitler in in school and go and say like, I've never heard about Hitler, let's start afresh and try and understand what happened in Germany. You will see this progression. So the first thing you've got to get out of your heads that it was a death program, it was a labor program. And you see that Bill Gates and these transhumanists that are trying to do digital social control, they um, and e-monitoring and e-surveillance and all those you know nudges and stuff like that, all all of those coercive programs, right? They are really a labor program. They're trying to get people to conform and they're trying to get people to work so they work their way out of poverty. Now that's how it starts. When things go wrong. Right, they don't start out saying, you know, we're going to wipe out the poor, but but they will get there because once the poor are micromanaged, in in to the finest detail of their lives, then when they still cannot get them to cooperate, basically things just will get worse on them. They'll get more instead of getting more and more, you know, um, it, it gets more like the Uyghurs and stuff, and then the, they get more and more uh, entropy instead of more and more ordered. So in trying to force people, coerce them into being good kids like Bill Gates wants them to be, they'll, they'll be more and more of a burden on the system. And at some stage, when the system actually gets in trouble itself with something like food, 
then they stop with the idea that the work program, it's still, the work program is still there, you know, basically in Germany, they, they worked people, you know, especially on the V weapons and all their magic weapons, they worked them, just just ground them till they dropped. They just worked them till they dropped. But where, where the mass killings and stuff come in is because they can't feed them. And so, so when you get to the stage where Bill Gates has got all this farmland and he's thinking it's all farmed scientifically and it's all mechanized and everything's done with AI, uh, that, those will, systems will break down. And when those break down, then they will start on, on the genocide. So, but, you know, and this might take years to happen because if they're talking about total systems management, in other words, even managing the climate and ge geoengineering, I, I'm warning people that they can, they can string it out a long time. The result is, is getting worse. It's kind of they're running a deficit on the results in the future. But they can run up a very big deficit. If you just look at how much, uh, you know, the fiat system in finance is a good example. It's, since 1971, it's been, it's been running in, in a disaster. But you see, they're still kind of tread, treading water. They, they're still try, just peddling in the air over the canyon with with the finances and look how long they've done it they've done it now for 50 years so it's they can really string it out now imagine the same kind of management done in terms of say climate um, or you know ecological management they, so it gets more and more dystopian more and more hellish but they, and the, the end result is more and more ca catastrophic but you have to give them credit for being able to stretch out the agony. And so that's, I think, what's, what we headed for with the WEF and the United Nations and all these, you know, basically New World Order. You're not allowed to say the New World Order because then it's a conspiracy theory. But guys, this has been going on for a very long time. The New World Order and the Deep State exists. I'm sorry, <laughs> but liberals just have to get over this shit. It's just it, basically they, they, yeah. But in all this bleakness, what then can we do except well, so, to prepare ourselves to accept that it will happen? Well, no. So my idea or, of the of of the stance to take in it is is it's hugely romantic. I mean, if you've only got one life to live, it's better than sitting in a cubicle. Is is resisting? So, you know, it's as a as a movie plot, it's a really really good one, <laughs> and I think that we win because we have the better narrative. You see, one of the things that they really struggle with the transhumanists is they Vogons. They have no imagination, and although everybody is futurologists. They, you know, all they're really thinking of is when do I get my flying car and, you know, when do you cure cancer? But it's like, so you've got your flying car and you've got cancer cured. Now what? There's no romance in it. And that's a very big flaw for them. So Charles Schwab and that kind of thing is, it's only inspiring if you're a Spurg and you just complete autist you're on the autistic spectrum and you're looking at the world and you think yeah i want to get involved in solving these problems but there's no romance in it it's not very imaginative if if we take the view that we're team human and we need to stop undermine just do anything we can you know you can start a secret society you can start cults and you can to, I mean, like, who's having more fun? The guys at the world at Davos or the guys storming the capital? Yeah, you know, you can create a way better story than the transhumanists, like, you know, uh, Team Human, we're the army of Eros, those ironic points of light, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Their costumes were definitely much better. I like that Viking hat. <laughs> but that's the thing. 
is is there's so much scope to, to for for imagination and stuff but there's there's very little scope for all this boring stuff if if you're doing backs and carbon capture and it's you know these these roll outs it's it's really like root canal therapy it's like school and and so anybody that says like hey forget school let's party man they got a much easier ride so at the moment people are, are not uh, thinking of breaking out but but if you know the potato you know basically I, it's so much easier on on team human to appeal to humans and fight for humanity and life so we, we're fighting for life they're fighting to for death they, they're fighting all they do is take living things make dead things out of them so that they can market them but yeah we're, you know, we're fighting uh, for life and it's messy and it's interesting and it's life <laughs> yeah it's almost like every time you hear the word manage run away yeah yeah so so, <laughs> so manage manual all of those things they they come from the the etymology of of manu which is uh, man and it's what's implied is i believe is is the hand so uh it let me just have a look at the um i think the sanskrit is quite an interesting and revealing thing for this but let, let me just have a look so so um manage okay um yeah so yeah so okay so it's a to handle train or direct um and then in brackets a horse so again i think the first people to actually domesticate the horse is uh, was the aryans they invented the wheel they certainly rode horses and so you can see that most well a lot of the the tripillion people and and uh, and those kind of guys i think that they get the word horse as a loan word from the aryans and so basically you're talking about this control uh, narrative, um, narrative so but you know i think that's why manger is also manger is, is because it's uh, the handling of a horse yeah so it's the handling and training of a horse manage so um but let's see what the sanskrit root is uh ah yeah so from the pi root man hand yeah so there you go i don't i don't bullshit you all the time that is i was right it's it, it, the the sanskrit root is hand so so uh and particularly in the sense of um grasping so it's it's purely from our alien cortex and the, the basically the alien cortex and your right hand is intimately related right there's in the crossover the side of crossover and the hemispherical crossover to the right hand is this left brain controls the right hand and so we get things like hey, i can't grasp what you're saying stuff like that all, all of those come from the idea that the the left brain alien cortex is trying trying to grab what you're saying so you know you're saying stuff and i'm trying to grab it out of there but the idea of managing is grab hold control um and you know but and especially digital because of the you know digitalis is fingers and digits come from that so so by the time you get to uh new numeracy um and letters and stuff they, they're digital so you can you can clearly see that anything to do with manage is uh to do with the left brain so so a managed extinction is what we're headed for and these guys are calculating with the with their alien cortex and the, oh, the narrative is controlled i just had an image come to my mind when you're talking about that so when you said digits and hands and alien cortex i've pictured puppet strings come from the fingers and then like a puppet appear like holy shit. <laughs> yeah marionettes yeah so the yeah the whole narrative of like jordan peterson gets wax lyrical about pinocchio but the Pinocchio has has a lot of a lot of these these elements. Walt, Walt Disney wasn't wasn't a dummy, that's for sure. And um, yeah, um, but the the idea that 
that you can hold and grasp something and then uh, steer it. So, so steering as well, steering also comes from, um, oh, I can't remember the Proto-Indo-European root for steer, uh, but, but it's, I think it comes from Norwegian, from like star. It comes it was like like starboard. It's a uh, from ships, right? So the idea is that you take a rudder, and uh, steering, and and the why why we have words like steerage and st and stuff like that in um, in with with nautical nautical terminology, is is um, is is the idea of using uh, steering. So if you look at the cyberneticists. And uh, cyber is the, uh, these guys are all transhumanist cyberneticists. Cyber comes from kyber, which means to steer. So kyber is, is the Greek word for an, uh, uh, somebody on the, the rudder, the helm. Not a helm, um, basically the rudder board. So, so kyber, um, it means to steer. And so cybernautics, um, is the art of steering. So what these people are doing is managing steering and using the right hand to do it. And so that's that. the essence of what I've been trying to say all along is going back to the Jordan Peterson, Stephen Fry conversation is, and what I was saying with the helicopter is that if you try and do that kind of management on a complex system, is you, you'll overcorrect. So the big problem with steering is, I mean, you can steer a ship because it's kind of simple, but anything more than that is if you try and manage in that way, you lose all the nuance and um, all the, everything is a sensitive dependence on, on previous things. So what, so yeah, so let me elaborate on that in case you, hopefully you're not gonna sleep already, but, the, but, Every, all these systems, the complex systems that we're talking about, the Earth system, even if you're talking about medicine and the human body, is they're all Kantian holes. And if you remember a Kantian hole, you remember what a Kantian hole is, class? Anybody? Please refresh our memories. <laughs> Not that so, we ever got it. Not that I ever got it. A Kantian hole is, so Immanuel Kant, excuse the name, was said that uh, the kind of holes uh, he were the Kantian holes is is that the parts exist for the whole, and the whole exists to serve the parts. So it's kind of like Hobbes Leviathan is is you know the state is there to serve the people, and all the people are there to serve the state. So then in the human body. You say, well, what's the what are each one of these organs? So organs is a word that comes from like organize, and what it means is to put into separate parts, just like an organ. It, it comes from the word for, um, I think, from the musical thing. And what what it means is we have organs because the organ is serving some function in the human body, like the heart is pumping blood. The stomach is digesting and the brain is directing. Um, uh, but the idea is that the human body then runs around eating and excreting and procreating and serving each one of the organs. So, so the, the, the body breathes and then that allows the heart to get oxygen and pump the oxygen around. So every one of the organs is serving the greater good the greater so the whole is not uh, antagonistic towards the parts and the parts are not um, antagonistic towards the whole and that means that that's uh, they have a symbiotic kind of relationship I think what Kant missed and what I, I try and uh, communicate to you is that the Kantian whole never stops there's no boundary so I don't think Kant can, got can, the idea that, you know, there isn't this little frame where you have a Kantian whole and 
the parts serve the whole, the whole serves the parts, and it's just like the human body. You can always go down and say, go down, say, well, that's on that scale, but I can go down and look at a, you know, one of the cells in your heart, and I can, it's a, like a city in there. If you look at all these wonderful animations and that they have of what goes on at the, at the biomolecular level, then it's wonderful shit going on. But each one of these biomolecular things, they also are serving the cell, and the cell is serving them by acting as a membrane and doing all this kind of stuff. Um, and an electropotential and stuff. So, so each one of the cells is like a miniature city. Then it's part of an organ. So it's, uh, you know, a Kantian hole at that level. Then there's a Kantian hole at the human body level. Then as a human, then you're part of society and you serve your tribe and your society and your society serves you and takes care of you. And then you can scale that up, you know, to the whole biosphere. And so the, it's a nested Kantian hole. And I think that that's something which people miss. But you see, okay, so, so once, once you, you realize um, that you have that kind of Kantian hole, then the problem of trying to manage it is in losing the resolution because in those kind of systems, they, the, you can telescope all the way down. It's kind of fractal. In fact, it's very fractal. And so it means that you can telescope down these scales. And so what's happening, say, at the biomolecular scale is then emerging at the cellular scale, and then it's merging at the physiological scale of the size of your body. But you see, there isn't a breaking point where you can actually say, okay, now this is the boundary where I manage. So if you manage something like, say, a state, or say, a population, like Klaus Schwab wants to do with electronics and um, AI, is you can't, you have to cut it off somewhere. You can't go down to the, look, the state is not going to manage you to a biological, biomolecular level. They're going to run and stuff and they're going to say, oh, you know, it's, say one health and the one health doctrine. They're saying, well, all of these are related, but they, they see them as related as like, okay, you have diabetes. So therefore they're gonna treat the diabetes. Now the diabetes doesn't exist on its own, like they think. The diabetes is intricately connected to all these other parts. And so it's, it's a long story of the breakdown to diabetes. It, it might have social implications, it might have where you live environmentally, but they can't keep track of all of that. Nature doesn't struggle because nature's like a big computer that goes down to infinite scales, maybe the Planck length. But you see, they have to say, well, we'll start here that there's a cutoff. And so then you'd say, okay, your diabetes is here, it's to do with human physiology, we'll compartmentalize that in healthcare. But it's like, as soon as you go into healthcare, then they'll start you on this treatment for your diabetes or whatever you've got. And then you will soon find out that it's the treatment you get or the course of the disease is intimately related to how much you can afford. Even if it's a social system like in, the, you know, a healthcare system like in the UK. But it's more likely that those social things will break down and become privatized. That's coming, by the way. So, so what these guys are going to be doing is they're going to be managing your diabetes, ignoring the fact that it's intimately related to the finance system. So, you know, how the care you get, whether you manage the diabetes will be, you know, the genetic therapies you can get will come with a price tag. And so if you if you can afford better health care for your diabetes, then basically then you will be more able, you'll be more employable, you'll be richer. But if you get on the wrong side of that, then you know you'll find your your, your finances get wrecked because of your diabetes, you wind up in a poverty trap and you're on a downward spiral. And then they're gonna try and manage that 
in a different compartment. So while you've you've got diabetes that's related to the fact that you you have hypertension because you can't get employed, and then you you know you your health is deteriorating because you've been kicked out of your housing, then it's it's basically to them those are all separate problems, and so but they're not separate problems; they're all intimately related, and then eventually you're, they'll categorize you you'll fall under some problem as the irredeemable or undeserving poor. That's where like the Victorians got to. They said you have the deserving poor and the undeserving poor. Now and these guys will be um, exactly the same players. And didn't Hitler and the Nazi regime eventually start calling like people that weren't like not useful eaters or something? Or was that like a myth? No, they did. They had, they educated the population. They justified eugenics in Nazi Germany by having posters and movie reels and a lot of propaganda to say that what managed humanity was was very important for the health of everybody so they the nazis in effect had a one health doctrine what they what they were doing was they put up posters saying you know like this guy is a neurodegenerate he's got no hope he's going to be kept under state care for 30 years it will cost 64000 rice mark they have posters like this and what what they're saying in the poster is is like here's a, a healthy young um like blood and soil aryan hitler jugend guy and he says think what sixty four thousand deutsche marks could do for this guy's life so like is it right to deprive this young healthy kid by this guy who's a vegetable and so it's a so the it's a very compelling argument and so you know that's 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 where we'll get to we'll we'll get we we're already there in fact and so so the reason the reason why this is not good is it's not good from so many angles but it's not good even from the angle where they're coming from and that's the idea of population management and essentially breeding humans so they're thinking in terms of like cattle breeding. But if you look at breeders, the the cattle that they're breeding, for the reason that I'm saying is that that's the, uh, the misunderstanding of the Kantian whole leads to entropy. If you're trying to interfere with the Kantian uh, whole, you'll increase entropy. And that's, that's what they find with say breeders. So breeders, you know, you can make a cow bigger or you can make you know a prize steer or a, you know award-winning pig or something like that but but the more you do that the more you struggle with deleterious effects so you need the diversity you see all those line breeding things you get a fantastic cow or something but that cow's going to going to really struggle in terms of its defense against disease it's it's like german shepherds They've been line bred and inbred too much and they will have crap hips so what so but you see the dilemma is that they can get the the german shepherd and then say well we're gonna you know crossbreed with some mongrel it needs a bit of you know um it's it definitely needs a bit of new blood but then the new blood is gonna cost the ideal of a german shepherd so it's not going to be a prize-winning dog anymore. It's not going to be a purebred dog. And so the same applies with humans. Is is they eventually turn into these effete eloi, very delicate, very domesticated. And, and the other thing is, as you go with this, domestication is not good for plants or animals or humans. So domestication itself is making you know testes shrink it's making it's making them un less fit so um less viable um uh, uh, you know i mean to eventually you're not a viable human being if you've been domesticated too too long it's like the camels in in egypt or in arabia that have been under domestication for so long that they can't breed anymore. They rely on humans to basically, you know, some some little Arab um, camel herder 
has to come and get the camel's penis and shove it in because they're impotent. They've been too uh, domesticated. So, so basically, they're degenerating more and more. If if you if there wasn't a human to actually intervene for the generation, they they wouldn't be able to procreate. So those, and humans are the same. Yeah, the I'm, reason why we're getting more and more Viagra and stuff is because we're getting more and more domesticated. We're literally turning into limp dick, you know, ballless. Uh, we're not able to reproduce outside of a petri dish. So it's it's like this is the price of domestication. Our brains getting smaller. We're getting more timid. Our immune systems getting fucked, and we're basically getting more and more of these um, uh, allergies and all these kind of you know secondary effects of and it's it's domestication and, yeah. and so couple and, couple of that with inbreeding with fuck yeah and then on top of that i think the authoritarian socialization fucks with the gen genetic diversity too i'll use dogs and wolves as an example because i've worked with both and a wolf will not recognize your speech at all like your alien cortex speech they don't respond at all even if you give them a name dogs are like you know have evolved with us so they are they're more keen to like recognize our speech than they are like their own senses and so i think that might be another factor that's going on with uh civilized humans and their authoritarian leaders is uh the dog wagging its tail or the tail you know which one are we <laughs> the tail or the dog yeah well it's that was that, our brains uh, up. that thing that you posted about so plague dogs you know Oh yeah, cowslips warren, cowslips warren. Yeah, the warren of the shining wire. Those rabbits, they're partial. They were getting fed, and they're being meat for the humans, getting caught in the oh, snares. Yeah, but that that was Watership Down, but the yeah. the oh the yeah, you're talking about the plague novel, dogs. Yeah. The plague dogs was about the cost of domestication. As the yes, women, when yes. they when they had to be wild, then they they didn't shed. You know. Yeah, I read those books in my formative years. Yeah, and I saw that video. I'm like, this is perfect, and I put that up there. Yeah. Yeah, that's just like um, those those dogs. That's us, for you know, with the imagery of Ralph being tortured in the the drowning chamber. That's like us in school, <laughs> and then they send us out yeah. on this uh, apocalyptic rat race. Yeah, it's yeah, it really makes it clear. I think Richard Adams really, really knew what the hell was happening with our society. Yeah, but it, it's. It's so much worse than than even these dark pictures. I mean, if, just think of Africa. What what's going to happen to Africans and stuff? They, but Africans. Uh, they, I, I can't even begin to contemplate what they're going to do to Africans. Even African Americans, they're going to try and wipe them out. And so, but I mean. There's so many programs that have been since since apartheid, ethnic weapons. And it's like they never stopped. In Israel, still building ethnic weapons. So it's like the research on ethnic weapons has been going on since 1945. So so you, I'm pretty sure there's no, you know, black Africans doing bioweapons research. So it's pretty obvious who's on the receiving end. And so it's basically you just do an IQ test, and the IQ test is a test for the alien cortex. And if you score really well on an IQ test, you're in. And if you don't, you you surplus man to requirements. That they, they, you see, they they can do a genocide very very slowly. They don't have to round people up and put them in cattle cars. In 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 effect, what's been going on in America with the prison system is a large, long, drawn out eugenics program. So if you don't get conjugal rights in in prison, they, the high incarceration uh, rates for people of color is to take them out of circulation. It's really to sterilize them, and so that that just goes on and on. You know, just I mean, it just works into the system because. If you some somebody of color, you don't make it in the social credit scoring system. Uh, you'll have to get a job in a in a less desirable industry. You'll have to live in a less desirable part of town, and those will be polluted. They'll be polluted with things that will affect your f fertility, and and so yeah, it's it's a long breeding program. <laughs> um, but yeah, but 
I mean, that's how it would be naturally if you just let the system run on. We'll lose diversity. But, but uh, and ironically, wokeism is costing diversity. So, so wokeism as well as a backfire, because in it's it's difficult to see, but in you can see it in just the fact that uh, wokeism is paralyzing. So you can't say something like, okay, let, China. You know, you can easily find an article that says saying you know the Wuhan lab theory is racist. So it's again. It's uh, you can't say anything against something which might be potentially um, an ethnic weapon. So if you were released an ethnic weapon, you 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 know, especially if it came from somewhere like China, you you can't say anything about it or say that it's obviously an ethnic weapon because that's racist. And so it's it puts a chill on it. And we've just seen how you know we've all the censorship so you can't say the obvious that it was a lab leak Fre freaking obvious it's a lab leak but you can't say that because the you know it's offensive and it's not woke and you know it's uh, so workism itself is is aiding this dark dark future and it's going to backfire so much on the people that they're trying to be, you know, have justice for. Like Africans are going to, wokeism is going to cost Africa brutally. Because under the strength of wokeism, you you can release an ethnic weapon. Ethnic bioweapons are coming. They're coming. They might have been released already. I, I told you the story of HIV AIDS. So HIV AIDS, according to all the rumors, and I never found a rumor yeah, that wasn't I, born out later, but in the South African Air Force, the rumor was that we created uh, AIDS in a lab and released it in the Congo. And basically, you know, you tell that to anybody at the time as, oh, conspiracy theorist, blah, 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 blah. But it turned out to be true. <laughs> Nowadays, you, you have to say, oh, HIV came from chimps in the Congo. It's like, no, it didn't. It came from baboons in South Africa in the River Plot lab. But like, they, you're not allowed to make that connection because it's ethnic bioweapon is really dark stuff. But it's 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 all there. It's just nobody wants to know. So so if they did HIV, if if South Africa deliberately released HIV, that's in the 80s. You know how much further they've got along that road with CRISPR and the gene drive. You, you know, I mean, what planet are you on that you think there's 7.8 billion people? And you really think there aren't guys in white lab coats that, you know, go home at night thinking, you know, thinking up uh, how you could do an ethnic power weapon? It's like, I'll give you the guy's name and address if you want. <laughs> it's like, and yeah, how, it, it's, it, it needs a handful. It needs a handful of guys to be doing this stuff and thinking this way. So that it's inconceivable that it isn't happening, but you're not allowed to say it because then you're a conspiracy theorist. And why mustn't you be a conspiracy theorist? Because it's going to turn into racism and you know Asian people are going to get beaten up on the streets. And they're like, well, a lot worse is coming down the pike unless you stop this woke bullshit. Yeah, with those ethnic bioweapons, it's like the cancer is trying to thoroughly make sure that the rest of the uncancered, you know, by bi um, biomass of humanity is, you know, converted to this civilization slave cancer. Yeah, so, yeah, they, in South Africa, they did profiling to try and, they did a lot, decades of research into try and finding the genetic differences. It was in the early days before the genome was sequenced and stuff. So. But they did extensive research into, you know, what's the genetic differences between black and white people, so they could wipe out the black people. They did it in concert with Israel. Israel wanted that research so they could wipe out Arabs. And it's like, it's all there. It's all documented. You never see that in the Guardian. Why? Because it's Israel. Nobody can say anything about Israel. Because why? Woke. <laughs> it's like. Guys, got to stop this shit, man. There's really evil stuff coming down the pike. And, you know, the fact you're not allowed to talk about it or you get canceled or something is like, wow, man. You, you're not even allowed to explain the, the, the Holocaust 
how how to you can go to jail for explaining the truth about what happened in the Holocaust. And if people don't understand the Holocaust, they're going to walk right into it. They're going to walk right into it again. So, but well, we better round off there. But the good news is that that you can explain all this to people if you get them in an um, alternate reality game or cult. So, you know, look how, how easy it is to spread any kind of information you want in something like QAnon. So, I, I hope that eventually we can get started on this, but it's like... Yeah, um, it's uh, creating the circumstances where people are going to ask the question, why? And once that starts happening, things unravel pretty quick, because if you take any of the belief systems of civilization and the progress motive and all that, and you ask why, it qu quickly falls apart. <laughs> it quickly falls apart, because there's, you know, there's no justification yeah. that isn't ideological. It's all yeah. all pure ideology, like Slavoj Zizek says, <laughs> pure ideology. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's like you know, like going to the moon. Like, say, but we went to the moon. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, so another what? question Why? you and yeah, then it's another... like, well, well, it's you know, it's, it's, we're gonna discover new things. And like, what did we discover? Fuck all. It's like, oh no, but it's a stepping stone to Mars. And then what? Well, then to the stars. No, rubbish. It's not amazing yeah. going from, from Mars to Alpha Centauri. It's like you're talking shit. Absolute shit. Another <laughs> thing that we can take into account there, too, is like, okay, how much of the biodiversity of the planet did we destroy to go to the moon? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's the same thing. Like, oh, well, Elon Musk is preparing, saying we, we have to be cyborgs to compete with transhumanists. And uh, and AI, and then we have to go to Mars to be a multi-planet species. And it's like, dude, what? It's not going to do you any good because you're taking the alien cortex with you to Mars. So you got the, you're not addressing the problem by going to Mars. So the only reason why you need to go to Mars is not because there's a comet coming. It's because we fucked this pl planet up. Yeah, and I think the whole the whole freaking space fetish that people have is probably just the alien cortex's desire to escape life manifesting itself in our reality. Like it wants to fly away from the the mortality of Earth and the fact that you know we grew out of this planet and we're gonna go back into it at the end. And you just got to get used to that idea because you can't escape it. The fantasy needs to end. It really does. Yeah, it's it's. It'll end the game. You know, it's, it's the game of life with with Kali or with Gaia. And it'll end the game for keeps if you try and win it outright. So they wanted to, you know, they see what they're craving, like you say, is death. That going to Mars and the, the whole thing about it, you know, when Elon Musk talks about it, it's a one-way trip. And it's the idea is that you can have a sterile perfection. It's a simpler world where we can start over. And all of it is what they're really doing is romancing death. They really, they really want to die. Because yeah. life is messy. Life is unpredictable. Life is complicated. And so that's what they don't like. They want something sterile and dry and stuff. And it's like, yeah, it's, it's a coffin. It's a mausoleum. It's yeah. all they're building on Mars. And, and you know, it's like the point of a game isn't to win, it's to have fun. Like I've noticed that if if I'm like playing a game with somebody and it's like getting really sweaty, try hard, people are trying to win, it's like, I don't want to play then. This ain't fun. That attitude, that sucks. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, I want to just have fun. <laughs> yeah, well it's it, it's you know about making love, you know, it's basically making love to the universe. But it's kind of the, they don't want to make love. It's they want to win. <laughs> yeah, and another thing I saw recently, one of my friends showed me this uh, cartoon show, and there's this uh, guy doing this alchemy to per, uh, do uh, perfect knowledge, and he's had these figures come into his life, like this um, this other master alchemist lady, this vampire aristocrat, and at the end when he's like casting the spell to open like this uh, um, labyrinth that has all the perfect knowledge that he desires. The vampire aristocrat reveals himself to be death, and death turned into all these forms that was guiding him all the way throughout this process. 
And he's like, okay, now you're going to kill all life on the planet and you're going to do it for me because I can't reach in the hell. Only humans can. <laughs> yeah, and so that just yeah. blew my fucking mind. <laughs> it's like that. It's like that. But you see, the, we have to learn how to tell the story and I think turn it, tell it on a bigger scale. Um, but there, there are lots of other people doing it. We just need to connect with them, yeah. you know. It's hard. You gotta, you gotta figure out how to retell the old stories. One of my favorite is um, one of my favorites is that story of Ragnarok and Odin. He gets that prophecy, you know, of Ragnarok, and everything he does guarantees it'll happen. Like, you know, he's scared of the big wolf Fenrir, and they trick him into getting bound. And that causes the wolf get, to get angry, and then he eats Odin's world. And I think that's like a metaphor for nature, because, you know, nature's going to eat us eventually. And Odin didn't want to get eaten. And so by bounding the giant, tricking the giant wolf and binding him, he guarantees that happens. And so yeah, that's that we got to stop. Ancient story. I mean, yeah, that, like, that all the way back to Gilgamesh is, is basically, it's, it's the story of the, the meeting in Samara. Is everything you do to escape death is defines how you you meet it. I would like to thank you for uh, explaining all that about the gargantuan system changes that you know everybody like uh, the eugenicists and the transhuman globalists are trying to do, and the wishful thinking part of me says that you know based on your system's background there are so many points of failure that it's they have so much hubris that they think they can manage all these and make it hap make them happen and my wishful thinking part says they're gonna they're going to fail they're they'll have points of failure the bad thing is that um regardless of whether they fail or succeed the consequences upon us and upon the planet are dire so yeah. So it was a great shame, but in the in the eighties there was a big uh, surge of interest in chaos theory, and a guy called Lorenz and that developed the butterfly effect, and that there are a lot of things that it was just getting interesting when they got into stable and unstable systems and butterfly effects and stuff. Um, uh, so chaos was getting really interesting when everybody kind of forgot it, and then got sidetracked by jobs and all, all the futurologists you know like gates and all the the internet and but you see where those guys were going with chaos was was showing that the system was very fragile because it's obvious once once you realize that there's a butterfly effect and a butterfly flapping its wings somewhere in mexico can cause a hurricane somewhere down the road in china much later is is then how do you manage that system you have to take care of every single butterfly and so you can't do it uh, but nature doesn't struggle Na nature happily has butterflies ca causing hurricanes and the hurricanes you know renew mangrove swamps and it it's nature um is pulling out all the this miracle out of the law of large numbers so if you have large enough numbers of butterflies they all cancel each other out like the rats on the glass um, just doing their own, own thing. So if you have lots of random sources doing their own thing, you get these emergent effects. And that's why it all works from the point of view of a Kantian whole. But if you if you take out the random things and you try and go for what I was saying before, the center of the bell curve, so you just get repeatable evidence-based um, uh, metrics that you run off, basically those metrics are very, very coarse and they don't, they don't go down to the butterflies. So butterflies are going to get you all the time. And then you have to double down on your control, in which case you're getting into the situation with the helicopter or, you know, over tipping the, the raft, the perspex raft, because everybody overcorrects left and right. So the, the, the thing is to just let go, just let go. Again, it's the grasping thing. So, so that grasp manage is you have to say, You've got to get those white knuckles off the control lever. You've got to do it. But I tell you, these guys like Bill Gates, they're too far gone. You've got to kill them. I swear you've got to kill them. I mean it. 
They, they cannot take their hand off. They, they literally cannot do it. But basically, if, if a guy is so far gone like that, basically, and, and he has so much control, so many billions, right? There, there is no way you will convince him to let go. Um, I absolutely do not believe it. The, those guys literally have to die. They, they, they are physically incapable. They, they, they are psychotic. They are. They have their hand on their control. And they are far too powerful. They're far too powerful from the point of view of uh, what they can do in terms of geoengineering and all the stuff they're doing in terms of social engineering. They're engineering everything. But they, you will not stop those guys engineering because there's only one cure. Yeah, it's like that. It's like that uh, cartoon my friend showed me with death. Like the once they're that high and they have that power, all they can do is serve death. That's all they can yeah. do. Once they're yeah. that powerful, that's all. That's you know, they're. It, it's arguable that they're even human beings at that point anymore. They're not. Yeah. See, this is what I'm saying, and then people people hate it. But like you, they downvote me. I can get downvoted to zero just by putting something up. I'm saying these people are not human. They, you, you, it, it's not, it's not murder. If you eliminate these guys, because they really aren't human. You're not killing a human being. These these people have gone over into they they're behaving like automatons. So it's. It, 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 you shouldn't, if anybody murdered these guys, they shouldn't be prosecuted for murder because uh, all you're doing is like unplugging a machine. They are becoming so mechanistic and so so machine-like that they should have a new category of uh, eliminating them. It's, yeah, uh, it's a crime. Yeah, it's that uh, a dictator sh a speech from Charlie Chaplin, m men with machine hearts and machine minds, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the great dictator thing, yeah. yeah you see, Charlie Chaplin had a big heart, so so he saw it. But but you see, everybody, everybody's too nice. All these domesticates are too nice. They think you can rationalize with these people. They think you can, you know, try, reform psychopaths and stuff. But you, you can't. These people can't help themselves. Uh, so, yeah. and and also, they they kind of tipped over themselves. So they they so hubristic, they so narcissistic that they don't see that they have a problem. See, the guys like Epstein and Gates, they're very similar, and they. I bet you Gates has been doing some very pedophilia things i'll bet you melinda Gates didn't didn't just divorce him because because he was friends with epstein is basically i'm pretty sure that basically epstein was blackmailing him for some pretty nasty shit and i'm pretty sure melinda's divorcing bill because he's uh, probably kinky as fuck when it comes to the bedroom and i bet you there's probably underage boys or girls involved but the but the the thing about those guys is that they don't believe they have a problem, right? Because they can always point to the world and say, you know, I'm a multi-billionaire, I'm the peak of success. And you know, any any psychiatrist or psychotherapist or anything would, would say, no, those guys are the picture of mental health because, you know, they're successful in our society. How can, you know, how can you say that about a guy who's has one of the richest people in the world. It's like he's the very definition of a successful human being. You say, mm, no, it's not actually. He's uh, he's so far gone that he doesn't realize he's a very very sick person, and the rest of the world doesn't uh, doesn't accept that because we idolize money. And so, if to say that Musk and Gates and Epstein and Harvey Weinstein and you know the Sackler family and the Koch brothers and all these psychopaths is is to say that those guys are sick means that we have to reject our you know entire ideology of capitalism and saying that you can only become super rich if you if you're mentally ill and people no one wants to say that because they all want to be meant they all want to be rich so then they 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 don't uh, accept that but only mentally ill people can be. Um, I have a question. 
I, I have a question. Um, when I saw Bright Green Lies, um, they talked about agriculture and they said agriculture is, destroys everything, you know, everything. So why didn't people years ago when agriculture started, why didn't they stop that from happening and have an alternative? So the, the reason I think is from, from looking at everything, the story from Gobekli Tepe on is that you have, uh, it, it becomes a trap. So what really stops people is you get warlords. So what you can see after Gebekli, Gebekli Tepe, you can see that there's a priesthood, but there, there isn't um, yet uh, a social hierarchy. Then uh, you get to Chatelhoyuk, that's 2,000 years later, that's about 8,000 years ago. Chatelhoyuk then is still very egalitarian, but they have death anxiety. Then by the time you get to Suma, that's 5,000 years ago, if you look at uh, Uruk Ur and stuff like that, they, they, um, they have strong men. So by that stage, you have kings. And what the kings are is they emerge out of the marketplaces. So what all these towns are is they market squares. And you get bullies that control and tax the market. So, so those guys become the kings, and then they have armies. The armies are just basically security guards for the market and for extorting tax out of the market. But in, in other words, you, you can just see it in a nightclub, right? If you, if you have any guy who, like, deals with drugs and stuff. So the drugs in these ancient times are the market. So it's really sex and stuff. The guys are going into the market. They're going into trade. They're trading flint and stuff like that, obsidian, and they're getting sex a lot, a lot of the time as the, the trade. And so so then that's the marketplace. It's That's the drugs that you'd see like a, you know, drug kingpin in, say, New York. Then that drug kingpin, as soon as he's got loads of money, he starts being a pimp and he opens a nightclub. And the nightclub is a place for him to sell drugs. It's a place, you know, where people come to have a good time. They get booze, they get sex, so it's a big attractor. And it's a marketplace. A, a nightclub is a big meat market. What really is on sale is drugs and sex. Feed, feedback loop, right? It's like a feedback yeah. loop. Yeah, and so so as soon as people flock there, um, they, A, get addicted. Basically, it's a reptilian brain. They have the bright lights and, you know, they have a good time. And that's making the warlord richer. So he then, you know, he has to have security at the door. And that's what, what they all have. They start to have city walls. If you look at the Epic of Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh is the first king. Right? He's supposed to be the first king. And the very first bit of the first thing where they talk about Ur and, you know, the first city, they wax on and on about how thick the walls are and how huge the walls are. And how big the walls are. You think, why do they go on about how proud they are about the walls? And it's because it's a nightclub. Because if you have thick walls, this is even before they have armies. No, there are no other armies to come and attack them, but they've got big walls. Why? The same reason the nightclub has a door and a bouncer is they have to tax everybody, you know, entrance fee on the way in, the whole... Thing. And that's that's what's what's going on. So you take a nightclub, you'll see that like Scarface just gets richer and richer and bigger and bigger. And then what happens is they denude the local surroundings. So they can't hunter gathering stops and they start agriculture because they desperately need to feed the party. They need to make beer for starters because if you get a concentration of people over five thousand people in one place, you've got real problems with sanitation. And the only way you can get fresh water supply, you can't go too far. You can't go five miles to get your water. So, so they either have to have irrigation or they, they have to have beer. And they mainly go for beer because, hey, it's more of a party. It's more alcoholic. But then you have to get people down mines and you have to get people in the fields. To, but what they're doing is they're keeping the party going. So they're not voluntary. The guys that go to going down the mines are criminals and the guys that work on the fields are guys that have, uh, have no options, they're, they're slaves. And so that's the only way you get a city going and then it becomes a feedback loop and a self-fulfilling probe. But what it's doing to the environment is that, you know, 
anything you can hunt and gather and scavenge and that gets denuded. As soon as you start farming, then you, you have to build canals and stuff because you've deforested them, you've killed the earth. So then you start salt, salt leaching. As soon as you start irrigation, you get salt leaching. So you won't be able to do much farming for very long and you have to move the field on and then it hopefully, you know, it lies fallow and regenerates. But you, the city's growing faster than the agriculture. So the agriculture has to move out and take up more and more of the natural environment. So it's kind of like a fire. You're eating up the natural environment and you're polluting downstream. Um, but you're trapped because all, all those people then, you know, basically, even if they left the city, they, they're kind of surrounded by deserts. That's, that's the problem we're in today. We, we're in the last stages of this process. And it's like every, everybody says, oh, well, I'm going to go off grid and stuff. There's no off grid. You're in the same problem the guys had in Suma, the deserts on either side. You see, well, civilization starts in those regions because the guys have no option. They have, like in Egypt, they've got desert on the left and the right. So you can't just say like, oh, fuck the Pharaoh. I'm not going to be whipped anymore. I'm going to run off into the desert. Well, they'll let you go because you're not going to survive. So we're in exactly the same situation. So all these kids saying, I'm going to go off grid is saying like, no, you're not. You don't understand the story. You go back to Sumer, you talk, you're going to say, I'm going to run off into the desert. But people are literally going to do that. People, you, you're not, the kids today think they're going to go off into an eco village somewhere, but they're not. They, they're going to, um, they're going to wind up uh, in a desert because you, you don't get plum land, which is agriculturally fertile and stuff, and to do your eco village on, you um, you know you wind up like the San people. So the the San people that I keep on talking about, they now consider desert dwellers that live in in Namibia and and the Okavango swamp. They're just hanging on by their fingernails there, but the, they you know they're not desert people. They they started out in the Cape and all the Wineland and perfect Eden. <laughs> now they grow the best agricultural land in series and stuff. Was all, all their land? They they lived in paradise. Now now they're living in the desert because there's nothing left. And the same applies to to us. You can't you can't get out of the system. Now you have to now you have to stay and fight. And fight means you have to take down the warlords and destroy the market. Which is coming, by the way. They're destroying it themselves. Yeah, the yeah, the market is like the dark heart of the crucible that all life is being sacrificed on. Yeah, it's it's all trade. It's commerce. It's commerce that did it. I made up that slogan a few months ago. It's a um, sharing is caring, trading is betraying. <laughs> you should put that on a T-shirt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you see, there again, you can only trade with people you, I mean, you can only share with people you know. I mean, you can share with a stranger, but not, you know, not thousands. You can't, you can't go down yeah. to Walmart and start sharing. Every, see, we better end off soon, but the people that try and start communes, particularly like anarchists, what, what they find is they can't get it off the ground because the, you know, you, you've known people, even in Crete, the, the, start a co-op and then you know there's one guy who has more money and more resources and he, he can actually set up the co-op and then all the other guys come in and they will like help themselves to the fruit or whatever and you say like no you can't do that you have to pay for that and you say what are you a capitalist is it like come on we set this co-op up so we could just share and say so you can't share in that way you can't like bring your pal say hey there's free food down in the co-op and then they raid it yeah, so, that only works if you have a habitat to hunt and gather from, unfortunately. You can't be connected to the market. It'll corrupt you. Yeah, and and then you, you the guys you bring in are, are toxic with civilization, so they have all these ideas about money and exchange, and so the guys fight. And so you can't do a cop like that. It just never works because, the, as I said, you've got to get the plantation out of the slave. You can't just take the slave out of the plantation. But on that happy note, you, to to get the the slave out, you need a new narrative, right? You don't. You can't sell them on some paradise in the sky. That's that trick is not. That's their trick. 
That's the enemy's trick. Our trick is to remind them, to remind people of their humanity, so that basically you you, know, you show them that they're tigers and not sheep, and so uh, you get them in touch with the their wolf, their inner wolf. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> What's left of it? <laughs> But anyway, it's only the wolves that survive. So hopefully you've got a zest for life and you want to survive. But rather be evil than be good if it means that you don't survive. There are too many people out there that, that are prepared to roll over and die um, and be good. And not enough people that say, like, fuck being good, you need to survive. Yeah, it's it, that, that good and evil reminds me of something. So I was in college for a little bit and in... I was in a philosophy class in ethics and they wanted me to write, you know, they wanted you to write like a, on an ethical issue. And the one I was thinking about was like animal rights. But what I ended up realizing is the same thing we've been talking about here is the, the frame, but I, I didn't realize it in a sophisticated way. I sat there thinking like anything I write is going to be inadequate because it's always going to depend on your circumstances. And you're never going to know what those circumstances would be. So I really struggled even trying to write something. So what I ended up writing was, you know, it, it, it was a clump. It was bad. It was clumsy because I was only like 20. But basically, I was arguing that we should remove all arbitrary constraints. It wasn't a good paper at all. But yeah, I realized that like that young that I couldn't sit there and create a, a ethical philosophy that everyone can follow because it's always going to depend on what you're faced with. Yeah, yeah, many people came to this conclusion, like Al Alistair Crowley and Telema, and those guys say, do what thou wilt, this is the only law. And the, the, what they're saying is that you don't, you know, most of the domesticates think, what, that's a terrible philosophy. You know, you're just going to be a complete cunt and just walk around being antisocial? Say, no, that's not what he said. So do what thou wilt, that's the only law. And so, but what's implied in there is the goodness of humanity, that you only really want to do good things. Exactly. It's, you, yeah. you, it's, everybody has this prison mentality that they think everybody's going to be evil if they just do what they want. Say, no, you only do evil things because you're in a traumatic uh, situation that's been imposed on you. So if people are doing structural violence to you, of course you feel like reacting. But that's not normal. If you, we had a normal society where nobody incarcerated anybody else and everybody was free, everybody would be decent. It's human nature to be decent. But yeah, anyway, so, well, let's end it on that because we, we need to at least tell our story in our neck of the woods that humans are decent. You yes. have to, you have to be a, part of that decency means that you have to occasionally do a bit of therapy for psycho you know for psychopaths i mean they exist sorry it means there's work to do but you know once that's done then you can get back to being human and human humans are nice yeah it's like uh peeling off the armor i love that i read that book uh, against history against leviathan and he uses the metaphor ripping off the leviathanic ar armor to free the human being within i love that that's such a good metaphor for it and he says that ripping that armor off is really painful, though. Yeah, for sure it is. But, like, but they, somewhere along the line, everybody has to take a lot of pain. And it's just, I feel that we should make them take more of it than us. But there's plenty of pain to go around coming up. I, I think that's, yeah. We must talk about that. There's especially the power of, the forgotten history of how close anarchists got to in the in the 19th century to actually solving this problem they don't teach you that maybe you should go over that <laughs> yeah that'd be a good one uh, a good idea to go over that too because like even i can't imagine like how i would you know go about reorganizing like i obviously know the system is wrong and i don't want anything to do with money but like I don't know how to build a society. We've been slaves, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, no, you don't have to build a society. You just have to get rid of the prison yard. Yeah. The prison, they came close to doing it in, in the 19th century. We must talk about it because P. 
people believe that it's we're so helpless and stuff is like yeah uh, uh, uh. Uh, you, you just you just have to have a bit of gumption and yeah. it's been that close baby that close yeah the and the thing is is like we feel uh, people feel uh, weak and helpless because uh you know we're afraid to learn things now because of the trauma but yeah uh, you 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 if you learn that you know learning is a lifelong process you just feel powerful all the way as you learn yeah. new things and new skills yeah and let's also talk about gathering power and stuff too so all right well so let's Let's just leave it there and just give right. up the whole thing and uh, yeah, and just remind anybody that you know, in case the state is working up a prosecution here or something, uh, like this is all metaphorical. We're talking about an alternate reality game. It's yeah, role playing just completely. Or, or um, nobody go out and do anything that basically your grandmother wouldn't approve of. Okay? We're uh, putting together yeah. a, a script for a book. That's what we're doing. Yeah. We're going to yeah, write a yeah, book. Exactly. Okay. All right. And based on that, we might as well give it up to the universe anyway. And just for deeply still, let out a big, long breath. Take in a nice, big lung full of air. Let it out again, just fall deeply still. So let's make no more claims on this. Let's not try and grasp anything. Let's just let go with the words Om Paramatmane Nama. Good. Well, that was long. Sorry about that. But anyway. Oh no, it wasn't your fault. We were all chipping in yeah, and all, contributing yeah. to the time. So, <laughs> <laughs> so don't blame yourself for that. This was a uh, this was a uh, collective That's this time. Thank you. Nobody fainted. We're all awake. Thank you. Have a nice week. Till next you week. Too. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Bye. Take care.